like one project. I know, but I want to just get it out. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the December 12th Board of Selectmen meeting. Tonight is also the first night of Hanukkah, the Jewish Festival of Lights, which will run through Wednesday, December 20th. And for those who are paying attention, it's 13 days till Christmas and 20 days till we welcome in 2018. It's hard to believe 2017 has flown by. Um, tonight we'll be focused on our budget. We'll be talking through, after our liaison comments, um, We'll discuss a budget review of public services, administrative services, and finance, followed by a bond anticipation notes debt authorization at about 9 o'clock. We'll close with uh, the approval of minutes. Um, given it's a full evening, um, if you guys could keep your liaison comments brief, that would be helpful. Um, Barry, I know you're banished to the kids' table way at the end. <coughs> Yeah, well, um, yeah, so actually a number of things I'll all need to be talked about, but I'll try to say them quickly. Um, I attended the Red uh, and HRAC sponsored uh, talk with Anna Ornstein, it seems like, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, um, and actually appropriate on the first night of Hanukkah. Um, she once again gave a tremendous talk um, about preserving democracy and ways that we can respond to some of the um, hate speech um, and, and graffiti around here. And for me, the biggest takeaway, you know, Andrew, you were there, so were you, John, Arena. Um, the biggest takeaway I walked out of there was with um, when she said that um, you can never make the unacceptable acceptable. Um, as soon as you do that, you open up the door for things that you never could imagine happening. So I think a, a really great lesson in these times, and um, the place was packed, and I'm, I'm really excited to have been a part of that. Um, also, uh, quickly, I attended last night the um, CPTC meeting where the Sunoco station um, mm -hmm. project was actually unveiled for the first time, um, 30 units um, with some commercial slash retail to be determined. That's a project that will come before us for a couple of things. One is that they're requesting um, two to three parking spots on Main Street, which um, comes under our purview, as well as the fact that the driveway to access the project um, will be on Green Street, um, and it's less than 50 feet away from the Main Street intersection, okay. which will also uh, require selectman approval. Um, there's some really great things about the project. Um, you know, some interesting, uh, you know, the committee um, had some interesting comments. Um, I think the biggest challenge is going to be traffic and parking, as usual. Um, there aren't any dedicated spaces for the retail, um, mm -hmm. so, you know, potentially talk of maybe knocking down a couple of the units to make uh, more parking for the retail to make that work. Uh, and then also some of the traffic concerns of getting in and out of there given the Main Street traffic. But overall, um, it looked like a good development team. Um, you know, they put some pretty nice concepts together, uh, and that was just the first hearing, so more to come on that. Um, also, what I wanted just to sort of put really quickly um, before the board, I don't know if it requires a formal motion or not. Um, you know, I, I kind of, like everybody else, really read the comments um, on our survey and really thought about, you know, what are some of the things that we as, um, you know, on the select board can do to kind of not only build trust, but uh, accessibility and accountability. Uh, and one thing that I thought of that would be really easy to implement uh, um, and also move in that right direction is the fact that we hold office hours once a month, um, which essentially means that each one of us does it twice a year. Um, I don't think it would be a necessarily a bad idea if we held office hours, maybe starting in January, before every meeting. This way we're more accountable, um, we're more accessible, People will know that before any select uh, select board meeting that they can actually come and and access uh, one of the members to talk about anything that they want. So again, it's 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 not anything formal, but I just want to sort of put that out there as okay. something to think about and noodle on, and hopefully, you know, really easy to implement. So that's all, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Barry. And for those watching at home, we're we're suffering from a lack of electricity, which is why the uh, order of the seating up here is a little uh, different than usual. Um, Andy, just trying to keep you all awake. Um, 
So I, the Town Forest Committee had a meeting that I was unable to attend, uh, but they are in the process of having a, cons a forest consultant come through the Town Forest and look at uh, you know uh, what sort of uh, sick trees might need to be removed for the health of the forest and um, so stay tuned to that the public will have plenty of opportunity to weigh in <coughs> on that like Barry I went to uh, Dr. Orenstein's talk found it um, very uh, she's a very positive person given all she's gone through and uh, I think the take-home for me was similar to what Barry said she you know she said don't, don't N normalize what is uh, what shouldn't be normal so I thought that was a, a pretty good message um, and I think that's and, and I, I agree with Barry I think having um, office hours every time we meet uh, at least for the during the budget discussions and after that is a good uh, it is a good idea I'd be, I'd be willing to do it Mechanically, it might be easiest if the same individual for that month just did it both months, or if there happen to be three meetings. I mean, December is going to be a little interesting with all the budget meetings. But yeah, true. We can arrange. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. I'll be brief. No report. John. No. I'm I'm clear. Um. Bob, any comments? No. Okay. Um. Any public comment? Chief. Sorry, I don't mean to be rude, but uh, we're all, face all facing the wrong way. Uh, good evening. I think myself and the fire chief would like to thank Dr. Brett and Dr. Uh, James Hickey. They had last Friday morning a blue mask uh, to honor first responders of, uh, of the town of Reading and also of parents of Austin Prep students. So again, I'd just like to publicly thank Austin Prep. <coughs> I as well like to thank uh, the students of Austin Prep and Dr. Hickey and the uh, staff. They did a wonderful job with it. It was, it was a nice event for you know the firefighters and, and the police officers and the first responders who were there. I just want to publicly say thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you both. Any other public comment? Okay. Bob? Bob? Finance committee to order? Yes. Peter. Yes. Great. <coughs> Bob? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does everyone hear me okay? If, if you can't hear during the meeting, just raise your hand or yell or something. Um, I'm going to give a brief, just a few minute introduction before uh, the three uh, folks on my right speak. Um, the budget process is a little bit different this year, and I'll describe how and why. Uh, the Finance Committee specifically, and, and some in the community, asked that we start earlier this year and make it more of a public process, if you will, early on. So we're here one month earlier than we normally would be. Um, normally the selectmen meet and review budgets uh, in January and to make an important distinction in January they would review the town manager's budget which must be balanced what you will hear tonight is the department heads requested budgets would do which do not need to be balanced um, this is a discussion the department heads and myself and my predecessor have every November December so we're just inviting you into that section of the discussion I guess is the best way to put it um, we're also asked to spend a little bit more time um, discussing past cuts and uh, the idea of level services. And uh, Dr. Doherty and I have spent a lot of time, including breakfast this morning, discussing that concept. And so you'll see from the town over the next uh, two weeks a little bit more of a similar style to what the school department has historically done. Um, I was also asked to encourage slash allow department heads to speak more freely. Uh, that's an interesting comment. <laughs> Um, so again, the, re the results uh, below, I mentioned the selectmen. Uh, as you'll see uh, at the end of my remarks, the requested budgets speak for themselves in terms of level services and past cuts. And I, I do want to address the last comment that with the possible exception of a brief discussion I had with the police chief or his predecessor about not discussing staffing levels overnight, um, I, has, I have never discouraged department heads from speaking about anything in their operation and those that know me know I wouldn't. Um, but I have encouraged them to speak a little more freely this year. And because you will hear from them about budgets they asked for, perhaps the tenor will be a little different instead of what the mean old town manager let us have. You'll, you'll hear from them a little bit more honestly, I guess, uh, what it is they really need. Um, I will say that culturally, um, all the department heads, uh, you know, present and past, have just been very reluctant to spend money and to hope for something that's not realistic. Um, there's really not a lot of sense in, in 
getting all worked out about a budget you'd like to have when you know you can't have it. So some of the um, difficulty, I guess I'll say, in not discussing cuts in level services is as a practical matter, all the town department heads knew it wasn't possible. Um, so they just didn't complain about it and they just moved on and did the best they can. Um, I've said it in the past and it deserves being said again because there's always new in the audience. In the audience. Um, you might find a better town manager and department heads individually in the Commonwealth. You will not find a better team. Um, the department heads work together as a team as well as any other, I'm sure, in the Commonwealth. What I asked the departments to do a month or two ago was to, again, it's more of an art than a science, but create budgets to approximate service levels from some point in the recent past. I've, I've put down five years. It's not a mathematical exercise. Um, this is the discussion we have, again, perhaps a little more off camera, um, every year. And it's been done every year for many years. Uh, but again, in public, normally, um, the selectmen and the public are not brought in until, you know, the town manager has swung the proverbial, uh, the ax to balance the budgets. So there has been discussion in the past about what was not in the budget. But I think tonight, by not seeing the balanced budget, you'll, you'll then get a much stronger sense of how difficult it is to balance those budgets. Uh, and this will shift our focus to, one, uh, to an approach the schools have used historically. Neither is honestly right or wrong, but it's just now that we're more comparable. Uh, when you looked at the town budget in the past, we always focused in on how many more or less FTEs employees do you have and why? The schools, if you'll notice, almost never talk about FTEs. They talk about level service, meaning a classroom size, for instance, and meeting some other mandates that they have. So the schools uh, will say, I need to cut three teachers. And we'll readily admit that's from adding five teachers that I need in order to preserve, four, uh, preserve service levels. So in fact, I'm adding two teachers, but I'm really cutting three. And that's semantics to some degree, but what you'll hear from the town uh, tonight is the addition of those five teachers and why it's so important in, in our departments. Um, the selectmen uh, will have the experts presenting the budgets to them. They should feel free to ask as many questions as you can think of. If department heads don't have answers tonight, they'll certainly get back to you on those. If you think of questions later, that's fine. Just send them right along to myself and or a department head. We're glad to get you the answers. Uh, to the extent that some of the questions might be complex, we might not get you the answer, for instance, by tomorrow night, but at some point during this budget process, you'll certainly see it. On the last night of the budget presentations, December 20th, I'll describe what approach I will take to balance the budgets against the funds available. Um, also, it, as a response to one of Barry's comments, uh, I too only recently read the comments from the Selectman survey. Um, the superintendent and I commiserated about that. Um, what I did a half an hour after I read them all at once was send myself an email about things I thought I should address, and if you will, dispel some myths that are out there. And I don't mean to overplay the fact that one comment that may not be fully accurate deserves you know, a great deal of our attention. But I will try to dispel what I think are some more commonly held budget myths out there about uh, how the town is, is operated. Um, lastly, um, I will not present detailed balanced budgets um, until January. That's the normal uh, process. This discussion was <coughs> uh, public a month earlier as FinCom desired. Uh, as you can imagine, I already have a balanced budget, at least in my head or if, if not on my laptop. Uh, but I really do want this process to play out in public to hear back from the public, especially from the board, as to what its priorities are. I can then adjust what I have done. Um, I will tell you it is, it is relatively simple to balance the budget if you think all the new things are not worth having. It is much more complex when you listen to all the department heads as to why they need new things in order to then say, let's pretend we have all these, now <coughs> let's take them away. That is a very, very difficult exercise. Um, so here are the budgets that are requested that are in front of you. The first three we'll present tonight, public services, administrative service, and finance. You'll see 16, 8, and 7 percent increases. Uh, tomorrow night you'll see the public library and public safety, uh, four budgets out of public safety, for 6 and 11.6 percent increases. 
Uh, the third night, you'll see facilities with a very modest 1% increase. And uh, if you will recall, and we'll certainly remind you, last year, we put a lot of one-time money in Joe's budget last year, which now comes out this year, which is why even though know, he may request things, his increase is small. That night also, Dr. Uh, Doherty will join us to describe uh, the current update on the Killam School and the situation there, as well as the uh, capital projects down in and around the high school, uh, the fields and so forth. Uh, on the last night, um, we'll do public works. We'll also include the enterprise funds, and you can see that. So you can see, uh, you know, there's an 8% increase. Obviously, we don't have 8% worth of funds. So I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jean and um, let her begin with public services, which leads the way at a plus 16% request. Actually, just, just Mr. Chair, can I just make a, a, a brief comment? Um, this is actually I, actually refreshing. I probably now read in my Reading Public Service career um, probably 19 budgets. Um, and this is the first one that I got where basically I feel like I have a little bit of input into because in the past, the town, you, you guys would have the discussion, um, probably a full-throated discussion, it might not have always been pleasant, about what we really need to run the town, what are the things we should be doing, and essentially you guys fought that out in private, and the town manager would present a balanced budget, and essentially whether you were on FinCom or on the select board or any other thing, you would say, okay, here it is. All the stuff got done. Yeah. So no one ever heard about the things that we're not doing. No one ever heard about the things that we're continuing to do, even though we don't have the staff to do them. Um, so all of that stuff, it was sort of like, okay, it's almost, not a take it or leave it, because that's not really fair, because we do put some things in. But basically, what we think is important, and the true cost of really running the town and providing um, a high level of municipal services in the 21st century, got swept under the rug. We never discussed the true cost of running the enterprise. You guys would do that figure out we can't afford it and put forward the things you thought, we tinkered around and then there it goes. I'm actually really looking forward to all of this stuff because I really want to hear, Gene, um, <laughs> um, and everybody else, some of the things that maybe um, you would like to do, but you know never felt like you could raise your hand and say. And then it's all up to us and FinCom and the community to decide if those things are really going to be important. So I actually think this is a tremendous process. Um, it's like a whiteboard. Right? All the work, it, 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 it's not been done. It's going to get done. And then we can make the decisions about how much money we have um, and what will get done within that. And then if we ask the community to go and dig in their pockets a little bit more, some of the things that we could add back in after we've discussed it as a group and as a community. So I think this is a great way to start. And maybe it's the way we go forward every time, whether or not we have an override or not. So. Um, that's my comment. Mr. Thank Chair. you, Barry. And just to amplify that slightly, one of the prevailing comments in the survey, um, in the collection of comments taken under the survey, was that the public felt that the board, in particular, and to some extent the town agencies, did not have an adequate and full throated explanation of their budgets, the budget process, the deficits. The concept of the communication wasn't good enough, the communication wasn't thorough enough, the communication wasn't understood, was repeated with some regularity in the comments. Part of the reason we're starting tonight a month early is to provide people with that additional time, that soak time to understand the material, be able to raise questions. So if you're watching tonight, um, by all means ask questions, and if your friends and others that might be interested have a question, please get please pass the word. We, we can only broadcast it. There's really no other effective way other than putting it in the newspaper or putting it over RCTV. Um, any other comments before we move on? John? Yeah, I, I'm glad we're doing it this way. I, I agree with what Barry is saying relative to the information because it's valuable. But I think we can't lose sight of the fact that this budget is very different from the school department's budget, for example. That is a budget that is managed and voted on and embraced directly by the school committee. By comparison, this is a budget that calls for our input, not for our vote. This, am I right about this, Bob? That you know, effectively, this is a you know, from the purest standpoint of how it gets done, and I think that's that is important for the audience, both here and at home, to understand that our role 
in this budget is advisory, and I think that's fair to say. Um, but this approach of seeing it all out on the table to create dialogue, I think, has been. Yeah, I, I agree with all your comments. Um, the biggest difference, and certainly a takeaway I got in the last year, is um, what you'll see in the next two weeks is far <coughs> superior than three or four or five pages of summary in the town meeting booklet, which right, described yes. all this very in a very vanilla way. Here's all the things we didn't do. It was just stuff on a piece of paper. You'll see now how real it is. John. So, I have, I, so this is the my first time to this particular dance, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have probably more questions than, than the other guys, um, mostly out of, out of ignor my own ignorance. But the, a general question I had, Bob, is um, how do these sheets ultimately dovetail with the more comprehensive sheets that you presented at the FinCom meeting uh, here a month ago, maybe, where sort of the bigger picture uh, is viewed all of our revenues, you know, basically all of our income versus all of our spending, and <clears throat> where this is just, uh, how will this ultimately dovetail into uh, that more broader spreadsheet? Um, both, as we sit here, both the schools and the town know collectively how much money they have to spend. Uh -huh. And that's derived from everything you just discussed. Yes. Um, the 8% budget is clearly well more than what we have to spend. Um, what you'll see uh, in the town meeting booklet and the process is the more comprehensive view. Right. But once that's discussed at the financial forums, that's not represented, if you will, until again, town meeting. FinCom has seen it, they understand it. Um, we could go over it again, certainly, but there's generally a historical uh, lack of a need for that. Okay. So and you'll see it all tied together. Honestly, the, the most comprehensively will be for town meeting. Okay. So a com we're not going to see accommodated costs associated with any, you'll any of You'll hear them discussed, but you won't see them in the FinCom format, I guess. Okay. I get it. Thanks. Okay. okay. Thank you. You may want to pull the mic up there. All right. How's that? Okay. Going first has its challenges. Thank you, everybody. Um, my name is Jean Delios. For people who don't know who I am, I am the department head for the Public Services Department. And I'm going to walk you through um, the budget that was created when the town manager said, put down what you think is level service. Create what you think you need to run your department. And um, I found that to be um, a message that we hear repeatedly. But to the town manager's point, we know that times are constrained. Revenue is, 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 is a challenge and expenses are out of control, especially in the areas that we all know about health insurance and whatnot. So I will take, take the blame for not asking in the past, because I realize, I've been doing this a very, very long time, I realize that there are other important considerations. So I present this budget to you not out of arrogance and disrespect. I present it to you as an honest appraisal, all else being equal, of what I could do with a budget that was funded to this level. It's, it's not meant to offend anyone or um, seem like we're really grabbing for money. We're not. This is just an <coughs> honest portrayal. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, Jean, when you go through that, when, when you when you do that, will you say, <coughs> okay, this is what we're already doing, and, and and highlight the things that we could so kind of break those out between? Because I don't think a lot of people really know all the stuff we do. Okay. Some people assume we do everything. Yeah. Uh, so I'll try, some I'll people try assume we do nothing. <laughs> yeah. so. I'll try and hit the, um, the high points, but we can certainly come okay. back if there are things that we need to circle back to. Okay. So this is the slide that I like to show because um, it reminds me of a juggling act. And that really is what we do with our boards, committees, and commissions. Um, we have, I think, one of the highest number of um, volunteer boards um, of all the departments. And we, 
we are all the better for our volunteers. And I work very closely with most of these boards. And I go to most of these meetings. Um, and it's, uh, it's what we do. Um, so I, I felt this was an important portrayal because it shows you, and the acronyms probably mean nothing to 90% of the people looking at this. So I'll take a minute and I'll walk you through what are these volunteer boards. The one at the top is the Community Planning and Development Commission. That's our planning board. And the planning board um, is tasked with reviewing large development projects and for creating zoning, writing zoning. Um, the master plan comes under the planning board. The housing plan comes under the, the planning board. And so many other uh, planning related uh, documents that we spend a lot of time and a lot of public meetings talking about. Um, that's a lot for a, gr a group of five vol volunteers. So staff time, and you'll see it in the slide, staff time is tremendous for the, not just going to the meetings. As you all, I think everyone in the room knows, mm -hmm. it's not just about coming to the meeting and uh, showing a, p a PowerPoint and talking about the issue. It's preparing for the meeting. It's the follow-up after the meeting. It's all the legal work that has to be done to make sure those decisions are filed with the town clerk. It's getting with the applicants. We had a, uh, uh, a contractor in the office this morning at 7 o'clock. He wanted a copy of his subdivision plan that the planning board approved last night at 10 o'clock. <laughs> this is how we work. And by the way, he got it. Um, so that's the planning board, CPDC, for those of you who want to do acronyms. The next one is the Zoning Board of Appeals, and you'll see that's another tremendous amount of staff time for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is a great board because they are looking at regulatory things. So I like the Zoning Board of Appeals because it either is something they can um, fit within the context of Mass General Law, or they can't. And um, the only thing that is a little bit different for the Zoning Board of Appeals are these 40 Bs that we keep bantering about. And the 40 Bs, for anyone who hasn't heard me rant on and on about them, uh, these are the, um, the projects that can be built without having to conform to local zoning. And it's a state law that allows that. We have no say. So the Zoning Board of Appeals gets the honor of going through all of those projects that everyone in the room is mad about. And, um, and that's, quite a, that's quite a thing to be a part of, and I've, I've been in a lot of them. So uh, if you're ever having a tough night going to sleep, put on the Zoning Board of Appeals and you'll be glad you weren't there. Um, the next one is the Conservation Commission. The Conservation Commission it, they are a group that um, deals with wetland regulations. And we have both a state wetland act and a local bylaw. And we have two for a reason. Um, there's a little more flexibility with the local, which is kind of nice. But they go in and they review these elaborate plans for people who want to do things in areas that were never meant to have construction on them, and they figure out ways to do it. So that's an amazing group. Uh, the Historical Commission is different from the Historic District Commission, right, Virginia? Okay. <laughs> um, and these folks uh, do all kinds of things related to um, the Historical Commission is looking at uh, all kinds of things that are involved with the town. Historic District is more looking at the actual district and regulating from that point of view. The Board of Health um, I've been very involved in the Board of Health for the past seven or eight months. I go to every Board of Health meeting. I know more about ticks and um, flu viruses than I ever thought I would. Um, and um, I'm, I'm very proud of the work that the Board of Health does and the, the team uh, staff that, that uh, works with the Board of Health. Um, we're lucky that when you go out to eat in Reading, um, we have a very diligent team that's out there making sure these restaurants are being looked at and inspected, and, um, and, and that makes me feel very good. 
but uh, public health is a, is a huge area that we can always do more in. We had the, um, the tick presentation here, and it was very well attended. I never saw so many people interested in ticks. It was a packed house. So um, you can only imagine the things that we could continue to do from an education point of view on public health. Uh, Council on Aging is a, one of our larger boards, and they do a lot with um, our seniors and how can we better serve them and how can we um, meet their needs with, <coughs> I think just last night they, they agreed to help out with some equipment that's needed for the computer center and so they really jump in to, to, to basically be a, a fill the gap of what we can provide in the budget. And then we have the Recreation Committee, and you'll see the slides on all the activities that we do in this town. It's tremendous. Um, and I added one this year called Miscellaneous Working Groups, because we've, we've kind of snuck another ball in the air. We call it Working Groups. Um, the Working Groups, we, talk, we meet and we talk about zoning. We talk about, uh, we have one that we're doing wayfinding. Anybody know what wayfinding is? <coughs> Um, this is a whole, <laughs> this is a whole signage and branding exercise that we're going through with an urban designer through a grant. Um, so we, we get these sneaky little working groups going because uh, we don't want to make a big fuss about having another board, but we need a group of people to get together and start to generate some ideas. So um, that's, that's sort of what we do um, outside of the regular town hall hours. I got very colorful with this one. Now I have to remember my colors. Um, so this is the Public Services Department budget as presented <coughs> tonight. This is not how we are in real life. Um, of course I'm the town man assistant town manager department head. Um, I have a community development director who um, has the night off tonight because she covered the meeting last night. We split them up. Um, she's also the assistant department head. And we're blues. Um, I threw a purple in, which is the community services director. Uh, and that's the position that we lost. So I'm going to say a couple of times in my presentation that this budget is about restoring previous cuts. This position was cut uh, about a year and a half, two years ago, because the person who was in that job got a great opportunity to go run the Y here in, in Reading. And, um, and he was a terrific help to me, a terrific part of the team, um, very involved in recreation. We actually have him in rec have this position listed under recreation, still in his memory. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that clearly is, um, is a big ask. I thought putting it in purple maybe was a good color to choose for that. I know it right up front it's a big ask. Um, what, we'll go into a little bit more about why I think we, we need it and uh, why, what I think we can do with it, to Barry's point. But it sits up there big and bold. Um, moving along, you can see all the divisions. We'll start with the building division. The building inspector is MAUV. The reason he's MAUV is because we're talking about adding the existing capacity. We're talking about adding a full-time building inspector. Keeping what we have, but adding a full-timer. Um, the rest of it's pretty self-explanatory. There's a code enforcement position that was also lost to budget cuts a few years ago. It's a very small number, but that's why it's in purple. Um, everything else is pretty much status quo on building. Moving on to planning. The permits coordinator, that will say a lot of wonderful things about tonight. She is the glue that holds it all together. She's the expediter. She's the runner. She's the person that knows where everything is. She's the person that runs to the counter when that guy needs his, uh, his subdivision plan from the meeting that only ended six hours previously. She's amazing, and we'd be sunk without her. So permits coordinator, that position's only been there for a year. And that's how we're able to do what we do, because of her. Um, we have a, an asterisk position below that, which is the Regional Housing Services Coordinator. 
That is the Metro North Regional Housing Services Office, which is something that um, we put together based on a grant, looking at getting together with our community partners from the other communities, and there's four towns that share a staff person, but more importantly, we get together and um, not only have the staff person track all the affordable housing, make sure we don't lose it, stay ahead of it, but any time a unit becomes available for sale, we now have a coordinated way to get that unit filled with an affordable household. Jean, who does that person work for? She works for me. She's in Red well, we Town Hall. We share her expense among three other communities. Yes. So that that's one of our employees. Yes. And then we we bill her services. We bill, out to the other and they three. pay. Good. Yeah. Um, we probably get a little bit more out of it because she sits yeah. in our right. office. Yeah. Uh, but we do keep track of it, and our partners are um, we're, we're very transparent about how it all gets divided up. Um, everybody's just so grateful that we have a person that can worry about this stuff and make sure that when a project gets approved and we now have to go beg the state to please add the units to the subsidized housing inventory, this, this incredible document that, you know, no one could ever figure out uh, how they, they track these things. But to get the units on there is, is not easy. And we have a dedicated person doing it for the four communities. And that's and she takes that whole piece and makes it happen. So it's a huge um, benefit. Um, the next purple, which Jean, is... A, I'm yeah. sorry. If I could just, sure. before you get too far ahead, um, I'm, I'm just looking at the spreadsheets that Bob sent out um, for the, the various, I think, positions up there that match... Uh, it, down here and I'm trying to understand we have currently uh, build inspection building inspector is listed here yep um, and that is currently one person no it's currently two people no <laughs> it's currently one and a half well can you hold the thought because um, I'm going to go into some more slides that will kind of dice up where we're at okay we have right now we have a um, a staffing level where we have two part-time building inspectors that were both um, the building inspectors in their communities. Uh, one was in Reading for many years, retired, came back half-time. Mm -hmm. Another one was in Peabody, retired, came back, worked for us half-time. And then I have another building inspector that worked for many years for Woburn. He works for us eight hours a week. So it's kind of like 19, 19, and 8. Okay. And that's all lumped together under building inspector. Right, 19, 19, and 8. In 8, yeah. I'll do the math. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, moving, uh, is, uh, did that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Did anyone else have any questions? No, Jane. Uh, I'm sorry, Dan. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, uh, Jane, you can talk about the staff plan or why that position is purple and what, yes. what the need is that's causing you to put it in there. Yes. Um, so, the purple staff planner is a need. We had a staff planner for many years, and that position was, I guess you could say eliminated, but maybe morphed into the community de development director. Could you define their function? Sure. Yeah. The staff planner is the person that works with the building inspector at the counter to process the applications for the zoning board, for the planning board, um, dealing with issues like the smaller things like signs. Right now, the people who do that work are mostly Julie, the community development director. She's doing that in addition to helping me run the department. And if Julie's not around, I run out and do the counter. So um, that's fine. Um, I don't think that's the best way to organize the department. We can do that. Well, yeah. it's it's not a, you know, when we think about your value yeah. and we Vision think about, better. you know, what the cost of having you do that at the counter is somewhat counterproductive, not somewhat, it's ridiculous actually when you stop to think about it. From a management point of view, it's probably not the best way to do it. Right. But it is 
it sometimes yeah, we, that's we do what, what we got to do and, and if that's where it ends up that's where it ends up um, but there are some other opportunities that the staff planner can really provide us with going after more grants um, doing some more of the planning work the long-range planning work like dealing with the parking we talked about that a lot under economic development um, there's there's a lot of work to be done in planning and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides but the staff planner would offload work that is currently being done by uh, myself and the assistant department head in a way that I think makes a lot more sense. Also to the work that um, I know we had more on a contract basis, but the whole uh, economic development study um, that was done um, sort of on a contract basis really sort of set the tone for our whole economic development plan and put it in context. And there's no way you or Julie would have done that while you're writing comprehensive permits and stamping documents and all that. So that long range stuff, which kind of laid the groundwork for um, some of the economic development activity that we have, yeah. um, I, I could see that for, you know, being a role. Definitely. And that was important, but that was just off book. That yep. wasn't something yeah. that we had. So Gene, um, I just, I've I've read about half of the override survey comments, and and there's there's a a theme of of, of uh, interest in how we how the money is how we spend our money and how that matches this. So will there be an opportunity for us to sort of line up these positions with uh, the salaries that are listed in the sheets that were sent out? Because it's 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 helpful to know, I think, for me and for the public, mm -hmm. um, uh, what, for example, the the um, the building in inspector is listed as this year, as, uh, not the the building inspectors that you just explained, are listed at at about a, a salary of one hundred and twenty thousand six hundred and fifty, um, but I understand now that that one hundred and twenty grand is split over forty. It covers 46 hours, so uh, Bob, forgive me, is an FTE in town 37 and a half hours a week, or is it a 40 hour a week? Uh, it's 37 and a half, and as you go through the budgets, you'll especially see in some departments that have, I'll say, great depth in positions, Yeah. Uh, budgeting is always done at the position level, so this right. happens to be one and a fraction uh, FTE building inspectors going to two and a fraction. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll see police and fire especially have tremendous depth with several FTEs in the line. Good, good. But the, the chart here should match up pretty well to the budget document in front of you. Sometimes it's a little hard to read because the budget document, for instance, staff planner, the English is on one page and then it continues no, on the second page. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's, that's okay. a little tricky. Um, okay, moving on. The uh, economic development is something that um, I know this board was very involved in. Certainly, um, I was shocked when the conversation came up, we should hire someone. Um, and we did hire someone, and it was, a, I think, a great hire. Uh, we'll ta I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm going to go through, I am going to go through the budget line by line and pull out mm -hmm. the, the salient pieces. W what's the meaning um, of yellow again? Yellow means it's vacant. Yeah. So um, the uh, hire that we made, Andrew, um, Corona. He, um, his family had an opportunity to uh, relocate to the West Coast, so he's gone. But um, he was here for a year and did a great job and really laid the foundation for a lot of great things. So we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. So yellow is very different from purple. Yeah, yellow is the opposite. Yellow is funded and, there <laughs> and empty. Yellow and is purple is proposed. Yep. Got it. Um, Make it a bit necessary. <laughs> the economic development liaison, many of you know Jesse Wilson, she used to be the staff planner and then she was a community development director. Um, she went back to uh, graduate school and then when she graduated we were able to convince her to do some work for us and that's worked out really well. I think it's what yes. Barry was talking about, getting a study done. Um, so we are surgically introducing her where we can. Um, and one of the things that we've already talked about is uh, having her 
pick up at least on the website and some of the other uh, things that we got going under Andrew's leadership uh, on the economic development side. So that's, um, that's economic development. Moving on to historical, sadly, it's just the volunteers. Um, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but um, one of the things that, um, going back to the staff planner, that we could do a lot better job of with more help is to support our historical division, historical commission, historic district. Right now, it's the same thing that I just described. Running to the counter, trying to scramble to get things done. Um, the, the volunteers have a lot of responsibility and, um, you know, you can run it that way, or, or you can have a staff planner and, and, and you know, have it run a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit smoother, a little bit deeper, I guess. It, it runs smooth, but just having that added depth of staff support, it's kind of not fair to the volunteers. Moving on to conservation, um, we have a conservation administrator full-time now, which we're very um, fortunate for a while there, it had been cut. Um, but for the past few years, it was restored to full time. Um, they do a lot of their own thing on the Conservation Commission, too. They take their own minutes. Um, again, staff planner could jump in and, and, and be a resource for them as well. Um, the admin column, the office manager is someone that worked for me for many years. She retired in August, came back part time. Um, <clears throat> the clerk, that's a yellow, um, she is retiring and um, that job will be vacant as of January 4th. Um, the administrative specialist and the administrative assistant, uh, the administrative specialist is a relatively new position from last fiscal year, but that's someone that's jumped in and really helped us a lot with the zoning board and some of the other um, land use boards. Um, administrative assistant, <clears throat> that position is someone that's um, mostly working in recreation, um, but that's another admin person. The administrative secretary <coughs> is orange. Orange is, the job is vacant, but we have somebody temporarily doing the job. So we um, scrambled when we realized that almost all of the admin staff was gone and uh, it was a, a gift from heaven that we got a temp who actually lives in Reading and knows a lot of the people in the town hall and is jumping in and doing this work and we don't have to have make a commitment um, she doesn't have to make a commitment but the work's getting done and it's working out great so she's so. a part-time person no she's full-time Benefits, whole works. No benefits, just um, hourly contract temp help. Okay, contract help. Yep, yep, contract help. So that worked out superb. And she's shadowing the clerk for the next three weeks so we can um, make sure she's uh, up to speed on all the stuff the clerk does. And which Jean, is it's that lot. way because the individual does not desire. This position is funded, true? Yes, that administrative yeah. secretary yeah. left. She Correct. retired. But the reason that the new individual hasn't stepped in is it's her preference not to take it on a... We order. could. We didn't have the luxury of time to go through the hiring process. I see. Okay. So you I still have a process. Begged, I begged, pleaded, pleaded and, and lit religious candles to HR to try and get me somebody. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a temp. And that's, right. that's been phenomenal. Moving on to Elder and Human Services, um, the administrator is another MOV because this is adding to the existing position that's already funded. This is the last position from four or five years ago when the division heads were cut to half time. This is the last position to now request to come back up to full time. And this is something that we've talked about and we've, um, when we've had extra budget, we've snuck in a few hours here and there. Not snuck, but we've added hours where we can afford it, where we have savings or vacancies. So we've, um, we've surgically morphed this position into, right now, 
uh, it's about 30 hours. Town meeting was generous enough to give us a few extra dollars too to make that work. Um, <coughs> in this in this model, it calls for a 35 hour a week position. So you want to bring it to a full time position? Full time. To service the fastest growing segment of our population. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We know that because we studied it this summer. UMass uh, Gerontology We've been Institute. It for years together. I mean, so, yeah. We have. We have. But. <laughs> but the experts told us we were right all along and that, that we should be paying attention to this. So we, we thought no time like the present. Uh, moving on, these um, the, the, all of the other positions um, ha are full-time positions. They're positions with people who've been them, in them for qu quite a while. Um, there's really nothing new there. And then, of course, the Council on Aging. Um, the Health Division. We have the health agent as the division head. Um, another orange, which is the public health nurse. That's another part-time position. And that's orange because the same thing. The person left, <coughs> but we have someone par Contract. filling in, Contract. contracting, doing the job. Gene, was the uh, person who left the full-time person? No, 16 so it, hours It always week. was a part-time. Mm -hmm. right. It was always less than 37 and a half. Different variations all the time, but we think 16 hours a week works. Is it your intent to keep that as a contracted position? No, we've started the hire, hiring process. We actually have interviews tomorrow, but we have coverage, so that's the good news. And I didn't have to beg anyone. Um, the next one is the health inspectors, and um, uh, that's another. That's kind of like the building inspectors. That's. Uh, an interesting combination of folks that um, help us out with inspections. So you have more breathing people than FTEs? Yeah. That yes. Yep. Yeah, but thankfully, we have a lot of experienced people that come and work in the off hours, which works out really well for health inspections because restaurants don't open till 5 o'clock. So if someone works a job in XYZ town and comes over at 4 o'clock, <coughs> that's perfect. Mm. Gene, do you find that if if someone's, you know, we might have three or four people doing it a half a third time, that scheduling becomes a problem and that maybe they might have a more of a full-time commitment elsewhere that they prioritize over Reading that we're maybe scrambling either for coverage or it, it would be better if we had um, our own person or having lots of people cover it. Is that a better model? because of vacations and things like that, that you can plug and play a little better. Uh, yeah, what's the, health what's the is best a, way? It's a little unusual with health because so much of their stuff happens after five o'clock. So I really like the idea of having a couple of part-timers who can come in and the later hours of the day and go into these establishments and do what they have to do. Um, the good news is that the health agent can do the inspections, can, if anything comes up, like, you know, that MWRA water main break we had a few years ago, the health agent can step right in uh, as a, an appointee of the Board of Health. That position is queued right up to take action. So we won't miss a beat. Um, and uh, so I feel pretty, pretty confident that we've got good coverage there. Um, moving on to recreation. Um, the recreation administrator, uh, she's been in that position now since uh, a couple of years since the um, community services director um, moved on. And um, the recreation coordinator underneath her is a part-time position. Um, that's something that we'll be filling after the first of the year, start that hiring process. Um, there's an outdoor rec coordinator that's a seasonal and that's paid. You won't find that in the uh, budget numbers that you have because it comes out of their revolving fund but I wanted to put it up there so you could see there was another position. <coughs> and then the last but certainly not least is the veteran services and um, where we have um, our veteran services officer full time, does a great job. He's um, uh, really uh, out there in the community and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on with veterans. Um, so that's basically um, in living color kind of what this budget looks like. Gene, would it be possible just to get a, 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 a color wheel to describe for posterity with these? Yeah, because I probably won't remember either. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, we can do that. Thank you. Yeah, if you put that up in the corner and send it to us, that would be great. Sure. Um, so, really, our budget, our operation is pretty lean and pretty flat. Um, we've had to stop doing a few things because we just don't have the bandwidth. So, like for example, recreation. Uh, their focus is on programs and the Fall Street Fair. Uh, we don't get that involved in it anymore, and thankfully the Rotary picked that up. So that's kind of the new model. Um, what can we, what can we, uh, you know, back away from? And we can do that. We can back away from things. Um, and certainly in this case, it's not a big deal. Someone else is taking it. But um, that would be the direction that we'd be going in with a uh, um, lean and flat public services. Um, the collaboration, the good news is when you're um, on a shoestring operation, you, you work together more. So that's sort of the silver lining to that cloud, less work in silos. Um, we are looking really closely at where the resources go. Um, we talk a lot about who to send at what meetings. Can I stop sure. you for a second? That increased collaboration. <coughs> that seemed to be happening when John Fudo mm -hmm. was in the spot that you've indicated, you know, and I know we didn't fill that spot. No. Nope. But it seems like that happens when you've got someone in that spot. Yeah. And the absence of that is a bit painful, and, and we've seen it. Yeah. Um, yep. it. It actually drives people into their silo when there's not, you know, it seems to me anyway. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's one way of looking at it. Um, I think where I'm, my point is on the increased collaboration is um, the uh, when you don't really have the money to do programming, you get together with other partners right. and figure things out. And Jane Burns is a, an expert at you know working with this group or that group because we don't have the money to run a program like that. But if we get together with some other folks, um, and she does a lot with with the veteran services right. office officer, and they can you know bring energy and drag all those pots and pans and food to the veterans breakfast because there's two of them and then drag it all back to the senior center um, so not working in silos in, in that sense um, when you have limited resources is, is is one thing but certainly to your point when you have more um, depth at a higher level you can drive that even well, more. You, when you've got the oversight person, they see the whole picture, yep. and it makes the collaboration more fluid. It does. And it makes the efficiencies improve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things that, things don't get lost. Right. Um, I think. And, you know, there is whole a whole lot less silo work. Yep. Uh, yep. When you have somebody with the oversight. Definitely. It, it's clearly been absent, you know. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Yeah. It's just... You know, it's a reality of making do with what you have. Yep. Yep. Um, so one of the things that we started a while ago was closing the uh, senior center at three o'clock. Um, the staff stays, but the center is closed to the public. Again, that's living within. Um, some of the community events that happen, and there's a lot of them in this town. Um, we we really talk about who to send, and. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but a lot happens at these community events that is very positive. So um, pulling back on that definitely will have an impact. Um, the building division staff, we expanded the hours so that we now have Friday hours. And again, to, to that line item that maybe looks <coughs> a little um, overstuffed, um, we couldn't do Friday building hours if we just had like one full-time building inspector and you know some right. some other model of ours right. we couldn't do that um, these retired building inspectors are happy to come in and do the work and work part-time they'll work on Friday they don't care the whole rest of the town hall is closed on Fridays so to get someone to work on Friday that's good that'd be tough um, the flip side of that is now on Tuesday nights which used to be a popular night for the public to come in and ask questions. Um, we have someone there, but not really to handle the kind of questions that we used to get. Basic questions, yeah. 
Um, I'm going to walk you through some data on permitting, and um, I apologize for how small it is. Um, there'll be some better charts and graphs that will make it a little bit clearer, but um, as I note up in the left-hand corner, the division lead currently is the building commissioner, and that is Glenn Redmond, who was with the town for many years as the commissioner and came back part-time as the commissioner. Um, then we have that complement of part-time inspectors and a full-time permits coordinator, and that's how that runs. Um, but you can see, if you can read the numbers, um, in 2017, and that only is up until about a month ago, um, that we're trending to be consistent with the past few years of very, very high numbers of permits, especially the building permits. Um, <coughs> the fees are up there and the inspections are up there. So I'm going to walk you through it so you can see it a little bit easier. Um, the blue is the building permits, the red is the wiring, and the green is the plumbing and gas permits. Um, the big peak in 2015 for building had to do with those big projects that we were permitting. Um, Redding Woods, Johnson Woods, um, those those were driving a lot of that, so it's probably a little artificially high. So is the number we're looking at for this year more than norm, in your opinion? Yeah. yeah, yeah. The past this year and the past few years is about where we're at. We issue about a thousand building permits a year. Yeah. But with all these projects that we're now talking about, 18, 19, and 20, you're going to see those numbers mirror 15. Yes. Right. Right now, I'm looking at permitting. In 2018, in the calendar year 2018, I've got 16 major projects that I'm looking at permitting. Major. That's um, it's 50 permits a week of one form or another. Correct. So it boggles the. I mean, it, it boggles the imagination. So everything's a permit. Everything's permit. a permit. You know, I mean, so you know, you fix just your you fix your porch. It's a permit. Right. Just looking at projects. Yes, it is. It's the same permit as building a house yep. I mean in a in the count am I right about that yeah it's sometimes people will come in and they'll get one building permit and they'll do a major um, renovation of their home with an addition and all that and that that's a little misleading because that's only one building permit right. but then you'll have other ones where they'll come in and they'll pull a permit for this and then they'll come back oh, I really the deck was worse than I thought it was now I got to build a deck and you know It'll kind of morph into a couple more permits. But one is five thousand dollars worth of work, and the other is two hundred thousand yeah. dollars worth of work, and it's the count is yes. the same. Yes, and it also by th these quantitative numbers and and graphs, I'm going to throw out to you. I'm just doing that because I think it's interesting. Yeah. It really doesn't tell the story of what goes into it. So I think that's a really important point. I mean, um, the wiring and plumbing inspectors. They're pumping out permits all day long, you know. Um, but even at their level, sometimes they've got to go back two and three times to inspect that work. They still have to go there. They have it's to go there, and, in and they have to go repeatedly. Yeah. It's not like one and done. Right. Well, and then when they find something that needs Attention. to be fixed, then that means it's a second trip right. and maybe a third trip. Right. And you know, when you mention sixteen major projects, that's not like fixing the porch. No. no. I mean, even though, you know, technically it's one permit, I mean, that, that keeps some, 16 projects keep some, a full-time person yep. busy all year. Um, yeah. Could, for sure. Yep. Um, so, Gene, on that graph, except for the billing permit burp that you had, that you explained in 2015, 16, it looks like uh, since 2012, 2013, um, the the wiring and plumbing permits are somewhat flat. Um, they bump up and down a little bit, but uh, it, it looks like uh, there was growth from 2009 to 2012, and then sort of somewhat flat. Now, obviously, there's a little noise in the system. But yeah, there's no question that um, we see this kind of activity in these kind of markets. When everything tanked in 2009, you know, you can see it in the, in the chart, we weren't that busy. Um, but after the recession, things got busy and people started pulling permits and doing work. So, um, you know, it's hard to know how long this will go in this direction. 
but I can tell you what I know about 2018, the projects in the queue, we're going to have a busy year. So, Jean, in terms of, I know we have the permits fund, um, yep. and I think those are more dedicated for some of the larger projects. So, you know, where we might be talking about adding some costs on one side, we've got a source of funds to pay for it that may not necessarily be from the levy. Is that true? I better answer that. Yeah. You know, I, I looked into that um, maybe six or months or so ago, Barry, and I'm surprised since I've been here what I learned that I missed. Um, the town meeting has to authorize which projects permit fees go into that fund. And I, I somehow didn't realize how many times that had happened in the past. Um, I must have been paying attention. I think there have been five projects in the past. So it's a fair question for the future for us to discuss which of these large projects ought to go into the permits revolving fund and then to ask town meeting. I have no answer to that, but you know, you've seen, well, I'll try to do it from memory. Uh, Haven Street went into it. Right. Johnson Woods, uh, Pulte, uh, what am I forgetting? Archstone. Yes, thank you, Archstone, and I think there's a fifth. It wasn't as large. But that's a fair point and a fair discussion. The, the permits revolving Stop, fund is... Stop and shop? Stop and shop? No. I don't, I don't know, Bill. Um, I, you know, so I was trying to think of the developments down at Walkersport generally. I don't think so. And there was a, you know, an argument why shouldn't they have. They're meant to absorb their one-time revenues, meant to absorb one-time costs, such as you need extra building inspector hours. So once upon a time, we had an assistant building inspector for a number of years, three or four, paid by the permits revolving. So that's a, that's a good. And that's where we hired our economic development director. Yeah. From so. You know. Yep. Um, and again, these numbers are only. You know, I don't have the last. Uh, you're, you're missing the last six weeks of the year with these numbers too. So it's if it looks a little low in 2017, it, that asterisk means you don't have full data. No, okay. Um, here's the inspection activity, and. Um, as I was saying, the inspections can be more demanding than the actual permitting because it's repeated visits, repeated times that um, maybe the contractor, you know, thought they were going to be ready, but then they weren't ready when the, when the team got there. And so it was a lot of back and forth with the inspection activity. Permitting revenue, I think it's important to see the, um, the wiring and the plumbing and gas revenue on the bottom. I know we've talked about revenue, we've talked about fees. I've done a ton of research on this. Um, from where I sit, and I'll just say this right up front, my recommendation is to hold off on fees until we get through some of the bigger conversations we're having as a community um, about what's going on with with, with anything else related to taxes and overrides and all of that. Um, I don't want to be, uh, you know, the first one out raising rates when the, the really important stuff <coughs> needs to go first. This is not going to make a big difference one way or the other. We know, we already know how we want to change the fees so that it's easier and that it makes more sense and it's more in line with other communities. We have it ready to go. Um, I just think it's better to, to hold off until we have that other important conversation first. That would be my recommendation. Um, Although we, we did have, we did raise the parking fees, the depot parking fees, mm -hmm. um, uh, with an eye towards making it uh, more similar to other communities and to reflect the costs yep. involved. Um, and, and we did that, by, uh, at least I did that in, in, in part with a with an eye towards an override and showing that we are um, leaving no stone unturned, as yep. John says. I'm going to tell a little story about a, a deck. So, um, because I spend a little bit of time hanging around the, the counter at, in the office, I, um, I s overheard the building inspector talking to a guy from Moynihan Lumber about a deck project. And they were talking about how this deck project needed a variance because the way the house was built in the 80s, you would never build a house like this. It was so close to the wetland areas, uh, so close to the setback that um, you could never make it work in zoning to put a normal, regular 20 by 20 deck on the back of this house. It had like a, a two foot deck. 
So we looked at the plan and said, oh, yeah, well, you have to go to zoning board because you don't meet setbacks. You can't meet setbacks. And he said, well, oh, geez, what is that going to mean? Well, first of all, you got to have a better um, survey, uh, you know, engineered survey of, of, of the land. Oh, that's going to cost me $2,500. It's going to cost take six weeks. Yeah. Uh, all right, what else? Well, then you got to file this and apply for that and this and that. Okay. I said to the guy, can I just ask you a question? How much is the deck? Uh, what's the cost? I said, yeah. Just curious. It was 48000 Deck. I said, for a deck? <laughs> oh, it's the composite material and this and that. I go, yeah. <laughs> That's what it costs, 48000 That's the labor and the materials for Moynihan Lumber to go out and build a 20 by 20 deck. That's crazy. I, I was shocked. That's the kind of projects that we see every day. Hundred dollars a square foot. Crazy, crazy things that you can't even imagine the cost. I, I hope you pass that along to the tax department. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> so when we talk about costs and we talk about processes, efficiencies. Um, Everybody always comes to the counter with a plan that they got when they bought the house 25 years ago. The plan is never good enough. Somebody has to go out and spend money on an engineered plan because there isn't all the information that we need to understand what's going on. So I feel like that cost alone is like a right up front whack that the applicant gets before they even do anything. And so to add to the fees I think we should, but I'm just a little reticent to, to do that right out of the gate. Um, one thing I am very proud of is how quickly we <coughs> turn around our permits. 73% of building permits are issued immediately or the next day. That's pretty good. Yep. Um, is that because has the permits coordinator been sort of the driver on that? Is that yes kind of what drove that? Yes. Because when we did our headset, that was one of the biggest complaints about it takes forever to get anything approved in this town. Well, it doesn't. Okay. Unless well, you have one of those lousy plans, then you do. Right. <laughs> which, which we then basically modify for free. <coughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Right. Um, well, that's, a, that's an important piece of work. I think it is. We I spent for is. a half-time position. <laughs> improve the quality of the service that people get. So. Uh, Gene, when a, a 20 by 20 deck is added to a house, how is the fact that that's added uh, communicated to our GIS person so that they can depict that build out correctly? Maybe Bob could answer that. I don't know if they can. do every... Yeah. Yeah, we have a, a bunch of systems that were sold, the computer systems sold to us as highly integratable. Yeah. Of course, they don't integrate at all. <laughs> Human oh. beings have to walk stuff around. So um, the GIS and the uh, assessing all get the data in theory, electronically, in practice, maybe by hand delivery on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, so they can both, you know, Kim can map it if she needs to for the wetlands, which is pretty rare. It has to be a big project for okay. her to really be impacted. Yeah. But more importantly, the assessors know there's been a deck added, <coughs> generally in the reval every three years. Now every five years they capture that. Okay, thanks. Is there a story in the in the 27% um, that's of those that are beyond two days? Is there? Yes, those are those people with those rotten plans. I see. Um, and other things that you Incomplete know the plan. contractor doesn't have a license or forgot to renew or it's some minutia thing or or it's a big thing, um, but it's something that it, it's just a miss. Um, Every once in a while, if it's a big project, the building inspector needs to spend some time looking at it. Or if it's a question on zoning, we'll get together and we'll look at it. But um, most of the time, it's small stuff that hold people up. And, um, and so I'd say, um, but there might be other things. And um, we, we're happy about expedited permitting as one way that we've improved. But I'm sure there are other things that we could do better. And what I am planning on doing is um, issuing a, a survey. We already have it drafted. And um, 
asking our applicants, contractors, homeowners, we have the database, thankfully, because we have our software program, um, the, the KIMS, Kim, Kim the permits coordinator and Kim the GIS coordinator, have already put the list together for me. And we're going we're gonna to ask, tell us what your experience was like. Good. Tell us what you think about our fees. Tell us what you think about how we do things and what can we do better. So do, is, I was thinking, is that a rhetorical question that you put up there? Do, do you kind of know some of the answer in your mind about if we were able to do A, B, and C, we'd be better? I mean, do, do you sort of have that or, I, or are you still kind of just sort of searching and... Um, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that we'll get people that will speak to the first bullet and say, I got nothing to say. I got my permit right then and there. I'm hoping that we'll get some of that. I think we'll get some of that. And I know that our team does a great job, so I think we'll, we'll, get, we'll get some positives. Mm -hmm. But I know that there are always ways that we can improve. And um, I want to know, what are those ways? And I, I'm not sure I do know. I, I certainly feel more comfortable asking the people who've been through the process what was it like. And if I called them up and asked them, they wouldn't tell me. Because <laughs> I've done behind that. A survey, they might, they might, I have yeah. done that. I said, how was it? Oh, it was great. Okay. They don't want to get messed up the next time they come in for a permit. <laughs> so I get that. That's why I like the survey. And I'm really glad that we can go back uh, two, three years to, to the database of who pulled a permit. I just want to add that when, um, when Jean got here shortly thereafter, um, the way the process worked was the building inspector looked at permits once a week. When the building inspector was done, then conservation looked at things without being flagged, had to go through every single one to see, does this affect me, and so on down the food chain. So not surprisingly, it took three or four weeks for any yeah. permit to get approved. And that's actually very typical in cities and towns. Um, this is a phenomenal difference. But the legend still lives on right. from those days, and that's why the survey is so important. Mm -hmm. What really happened? Never mind the stories you hear, and you know the board will hear some stories sometimes, and then you ask the question, when did that happen? Well, that was you know seven or eight or 15 years ago. Okay, things are different. I think it's important to recognize that, and I agree with you, Barry. You know, the EDSAT did open our eyes to a few things. This is one of them. Gene, I think the survey is a great, a really good idea. It, it'll give you and the, the board some valuable feedback. I would just <coughs> caution against uh, asking people if they think about the fees. Um, few people will say the fee is too low and, and my wife would be quick to point out to me that I didn't ask her about her depot fee. Uh, parking fee before we <laughs> raised it. So um, they're, they're, just be aware that that is out there. Okay. John? Can I ask a quick question? Yes, Mark. I guess the, you know, the elephant in the room. I appreciate Dean, your, your comment on, you know, hey, maybe it's not the right time to change the fee. But what would the impact be? Say you've done the analysis. What would the impact be? Yeah, it's, it's less than 50000 in the in a year. Um, it's certainly with the kinds of things we're talking about, it's not anything major. So to, I guess my feeling is, is it worth it to go through upsetting the apple cart for a very small return? The only counter that would be that if we don't take all the small things or many of the small things, it'll never add up. Anymore. So I just, I think we need to talk through yeah. what that is. Well, how we get a it's lot like of- about 10% roughly. We get a lot of angry people at the counter who are mad they have to spend $2,500 on an engineering plot plan to put a deck on, even when they're spending 48000 That's a real story. But they're not paying the $2,500 to us. No, but right. we're saying we need a plan, and they're angry. They're angry <laughs> because they have to spend that money and have that delay. And that's and before they write the check for the permit. That's bef We haven't even gotten to that yet. Well, right, check. right. We mean, haven't even gotten to that yet. We can't. There's not much we can do about that. Them's, them's the rules. But, but I, I think that we do make sure we do. We need do need to try to cover our costs with with fees <coughs> in this area, um, especially when we're delivering. It sounds like faster service. <coughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's it, 
it's something we've spent a lot of time looking at. And um, I agree that the fees should be adjusted. It's just a question of when. Now I'm going to switch over to planning. And uh, Julie Mercier, who a lot of you know, is the Community Development Director, and she leads that division. And I pulled this quote off of the American Planning Association. Planning provides the foundation for communities to thrive. Planning empowers residents to envision new possibilities and prepare for the future. That's really what we're talking about. Um, and some of the things that we've done in planning is streamlining the development review and we've eased the zoning requirements. We had the major rewrite of zoning a few years ago, mm -hmm. but even in the last couple of years, we've um, made it easier to get through a minor site plan review, mm -hmm. and that's been something that's worked very well. It's a lot more work for staff, um, and there's no fees associated with it, but we can get people through so that um, a new business opening up like the bookstore doesn't have to go through all kinds of crazy stuff with planning board and this and that. <coughs> Now we can charge those people. We can take the bookstore and say, hey, you've got to pay $1,000. It's a minor site plan review. We can do that. It's whatever you, you know. I think that's ill-advised in light of the economic development plans that we've tried to work on. For $1,000, is it worth going there? Yeah, the focus of tonight is to go through the IS map, the way we are built now, the today map. There's probably work we can do around the edges, but the primary goal here is to get the baseline gap around town operations. The fees will be a second, a secondary or a tertiary factor on that, and I think it's actually distracting to even bring them up right now. Um, the other thing we spend a lot of time on is our collaboration and working with other departments like engineering. We do a development review teams. We get everyone around the table. We flesh out what the issues are long before these proposals make their way before the planning board or the zoning board. Um, we do pre-construction so that when they get underway with their permits, we don't have uh, major issues with them clogging up the streets with pickup trucks and um, creating all kinds of nightmares around town. Um, the community partners piece is a big piece of planning. We do a lot with our regional planning agency, the North Shore, uh, the North Suburban Planning Council. The, I talked about the regional plan housing office that we started. Um, we get together with the economic development directors from surrounding towns, and we work a lot with our state partners, and they come in and support a lot of our initiatives. And having Jay Ash at our um, <coughs> economic development summit last fall was, was really great. And being plugged into that network really serves us well on our efforts with planning and economic development. Um, we do spend a lot of time doing regulatory work, zoning and violations, enforcement. We respond to complaints, get a lot of complaints. I usually try and get them, pawn them off to Matt, but he usually sends them back to me. Um, we, um, we spend a lot of time on the boards, as, as I've mentioned. Um, a key change back in 2013 was getting this new um, software program to do permitting and to do, as Bob mentioned, the review so that conservation, historic, all of the components of the review are tied together in one organized fashion as opposed to the way we used to do it. People would just run in and out of the building inspector's office and say, don't issue that permit, let me look at it first. So this is a much more civilized way of doing things and um, with the permits coordinator we're able to function very well. Losing that staff planner and we even had a planning intern back in 2016 has made it enormously challenging. Um, we did add an administrative specialist position in 2017, and that has helped us with our nighttime government. Um, and then just a m mention there about the CPDC was short a full member, but we are um, fully staffed on CPDC, so that's worked out well. These are the kinds of things we do in planning, everything from master planning, the parking study, housing production plan, bike and pedestrian plan, cultural district exploratory study, economic development action plan, hazard mitigation plan update, South Main Street roadway diet, housing production plan renewal, and wayfinding and branding. Um, the economic development director I'm just going to talk about for a minute. You know, we, we really looked, we spent a lot of time on economic development planning. But you can't always plan, even though I do love planning. 
you actually have to do things once in a while. And then w when we had the opportunity to hire this economic development director who was so good, he actually went into the community and began to develop relationships with the community, with the business community, with the realtors, with all of the people that um, have an opinion about Reading, and, and met with them and worked with them. How can we get economic development going? How can we make things um, positive in this area? And that was a huge benefit. Um, so the work that he's done and the studies that we've done, um, the, yeah, the summit that we held, um, and so many more things that we've done in the past year has really laid a very nice foundation. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you read the paper this morning that the government has proposed on the zoning. Yes. Yeah. Two thirds. 50%? Yep. And there's an incentive to do so financially for the state? Mm hmm. Is that something you might want to yep. tell me? Yep. Yep. Did Andrew give us a, an exit summary? He did. Um, that's not a surprise. I was <laughs> sure he would be very thorough. I think that would be very No, it was good. It was good. Bob and I had a good meeting with him. Yeah. Pardon me? I actually wish them well. <laughs> I'm sorry he was here so long. Really <laughs> Thank you. I'm um, sure this it made his day, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> this is just a summary of um, some of the meetings. Um, we meet about anywhere between 20 and 23 times a year with CPDC. We do a lot of um, plan endorsements, subdivisions, site plan reviews, uh, sign permits, 40-yard developments, and the like. Um, and then there's all the planning stories. And the intangible story that um, I had asked everyone to give me something to talk about, in this case it was Julie who had been here for almost two years and uh, really has worked hard at this collaboration piece with all the staff divisions on projects, especially conservation and engineering, so that these projects can go above and beyond and not just be your typical projects, but really speak well to the town of Reading. This slide most of you have seen before. This is our subsidized housing inventory. This is the, um, the game that the state plays with us on <coughs> whether or not we're there yet. Are, you, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Well, we're not there yet, but we're getting close. And uh, we're only 117 units short of meeting the state requirement of 10% affordable housing. So we are getting, as they say, wicked close. That'll change um, again in 2020. <laughs> yeah. Right? And that, isn't bad that when it changes is, again when we have a new that's census? That's it. Yeah. The bad news is we, yeah. we continue to uh, be challenged with this formula. But if everything goes the right way and all these projects happen, um, we think we're going to get to 10.99% soon. So, um, Any forecast on what you think the, uh, the new numerator and denominator will be? I don't know. I really don't. I can't even venture a guess. Well, Does that all the new people that moved in, like, just well, those new yeah, projects? I mean, we know, I mean, we have some general idea. Oh, I just thought you said when. You mean uh, no, how no, much? No, I know it's coming. Yeah, yeah. You know, 2020, um, but. I, I think we're going to probably be a couple hundred units short. Wow. Well, at a minimum, all of the SHI that you added gets added to the denarius. Right. right. So this, right. how much of that 841 was added since 2010? Do you have an opinion? You know, it's, this one's going to be trickier um, because there were so many big projects. The um, Reading Woods is really going to tip the scales and make this a tougher, a tougher thing. Because of the amount, because There's of the so amount many of units. Residents. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. There's yeah. so yeah. many that's units. Gonna, so even you know, if that's twenty percent affordable, eighty percent of the room. Exactly. Not about exactly. exactly. It's only a third. That one. That one big, hurts. Right. Well, for this exercise. Well, for this exercise, but from a revenue standpoint, you know, you know yep. it was a pretty serious contribution to the bottom line. The good news is that we have a two-year certification. Safe harbor is in place. Now, the first year of that is almost gone, yeah. but. Um, through February 22nd, 2019, we have a safe harbor. What we do with it, that's another discussion, but um, we're only one of a handful of communities that have accomplished that. So I think that's, that's um, yeah. even with how crazy this whole thing is, that's a big accomplishment. Gene, uh, when you presented the map of Massachusetts, there was a lot of communities col colored white. Yep. 
they don't have any track record they're not participating what's the state doing about that nothing really no penalty for non-compliance the penalty. only the only thing that you that you lose out on if you say I'm, I'm not just not even going to worry about this is you don't get that safe harbor the only way you get to have this safe harbor is if you have a housing production plan which is why we're updating the one we have so we can stay stay current it's a lot of work well those white communities those communities that were didn't have a color yeah are you know they're free they're open game open season for 40 B. absolutely I mean anybody can come in there and almost no, do anything they want to yep. do they're not economic yeah. hot, hot beds like right. yeah yep. if you don't try and do this kind of thing to be proactive and plan then all bets are off on what could go where. This 40 B, it could go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Literally, it does not have to go by any local zoning. So we're, I think we're headed in the right direction this way, and uh, hopefully, <coughs> hopefully, it, you know, it'll all work out. Um, I'm just going to quickly go through because I know I'm taking way too much time. But conservation, uh, there's a lot of great things happening here. Um, Again, this position had been part-time. It's been full-time for a couple of years now. De spends a lot of time supporting the Conservation Commission. Spends a lot of time, um, like the building inspectors and the planners, at the counter helping people um, understand the process of the permitting. And um, it also oversees the uh, Matera cabin and spends a lot of time at town events. It works with the Boy Scouts and schools and workshops on environmental issues. Um, and so um, the, I guess the key thing here was Matera Cabin was used 96 times for Reading Recreation Program days and 32 rental days for a total of 128 active use days. So it's, um, it's used pretty heavily. Um, the, um, you know, the, the fact that we have it, I think, is, is, a, is a good resource. Um, and then... Uh, the revenue from the fees, which I'll talk to you about in a minute, um, that has kicked up, especially in that local bylaw, and you'll see that. Um, the one thing I would want to mention is that the commission adopted a tree policy, which allows tree removal um, uh, without a permit or a public meeting requirement. So that simplifies that. Uh, but I think it's, I, I'm not going to explain it as well as Chuck could, but um, it's a one for one if you're, if you're losing trees, you got to replace the tree. Um, and then this intangible story was about a uh, homeowner that um, had a conservation restriction. It was a legal binding document. They wanted to do some things and um, they came back to the commission and you know the commission didn't really have to relinquish anything that was in that document. But they did find a way to work through it and, um, um, and came up with a, a, a project that was going to work for the commission and for the applicant. So that's the kind of direction we're going in here to try and work with people, you know, still going by our regulations, but trying to find ways to work things out. And I, I would just like to stress that that is such an important position, the conservation administrator, the personality, the approach to the yep. customer makes yep. all the difference. It does. We, we have not always had people of Chuck's caliber in that position. Right. And we've earned a bad reputation because of it. We, we did a yeah. survey a few years ago. In fact, I, I used that uh, for the building inspector survey. I pulled the old survey out that we did on conservation, and I, I, I yep. guess I forgot some of the comments that we got. Yeah, we, it was we, brutal. we heard a lot of bad stuff. But we're doing better. Um, this is again just a, a picture or a snapshot of where we are on the permits. A little bit clearer like this, the fees. And the red is the, um, the Reading General Bylaw. The blue is the, uh, the State Wetlands Protection Act. So you can see the fees are up. Um, I won't bore you with this. Um, moving on, historic. Um, again, this is mostly volunteers. Some support from planning and admin <coughs> staff, but um, I think with a staff planner, we could really do a better job of, of working with Historic. Um, they do a lot of great work, and there's a lot to this. Um, and I'd love to be able to help them out and give them some staff support. Um, that Historic District met 11 times in 2017, kind of a lot. And the Historical Commission met 19 times and had four demolition delay applications, which is kind of a lot. 
Now moving on to health. Um, as I mentioned before, this is a big area from nuisance complaints to housing to food establishments, tobacco, on and on and on um, of what we permit under health. Um, the mandatory <coughs> minimum of two routine inspections for all establishments, that's the, uh, the schedule that we go by. That's convenience store, gas stations, restaurants, obviously. Um, this year we worked with uh, North Reading and we did some, a few different things around the flu clinics. We had uh, one or two at Walmart. We had one of the uh, Coolidge, the Town Hall, the DPW, the residents at Pearl, and then the multiple home visits. And this is where we, um, back to my point earlier about how when your resources are thin, you figure a way to work with others. And um, kudos to the health agent for um, figuring out a way with, you know, limited hours of the um, public health nurse to get this done. And, and <coughs> as far as I know, any anytime someone needed a home visit from our public health nurse, uh, we never had a problem. So um, that's been a, a, a good program. Um, the, uh, the changes in 2017, um, you know, we're staying current with the 3B emergency preparedness, which is also something that comes under health. Um, and we're working very closely with the Board of Health on so many initiatives. And um, the Code Red aware Emergency Awareness for residential and business community, that's, that's been something we've been working on too. Um, so you can see the key stats. The Fall Street Fair had 47 establishments, so that was a lot of work for the inspectors uh, and the health agent. And um, five new food establishments came into Reading, and they need that takes a lot of work. You got to look at review the plans and the kitchen and make sure and verify. Um, so uh, we're glad to have them, um, and we're glad that they're safe. And um, 49 complaints were documented between housing, nuisance, and food. Um, that's that's almost one a week, which is a little bit unusual. Um, and again, working with North Reading, uh, we've just found ways to um, get all those flu vaccines done and um, you know get the job done. Elder and Human Services. Uh, this is led by Jane Burns, the Human Elder Services Administrator. Um, there's a lot I could say about Human Elder Services. We had uh, UMass do a needs assessment this summer. We learned a lot about what are the things that we need to do with this division, what are the things that we're, <coughs> we should be thinking about and planning for this fastest growing segment of the population, this most frail, the most fragile um, population in the town, uh, most vulnerable, most isolated. Um, what, could we, what should we be doing? What should we be focusing on? And certainly transportation is top of the list, no, no surprise. Um, but also, so many of them are uh, in need of referrals for health care, food stamps. Um, uh, you'd be surprised at how many we have come for fuel assistance. And all of the things that, um, that we do every day um, to, to try and service this population. Um, so we've been lucky to get some grant funding. We've been doing this memory cafe, which has been fantastic. This is for, um, uh, I guess it's families that come and they're uh, dealing with memory loss. And they're very creative ways of working with little um, workshops with the caregivers, with the families, members to, um, to have some activities. Um, so many other things working with the high school boys hockey, the lacrosse team, shoveling program, and um, I guess the intangible story was the story I briefly alluded to about the Veterans Day breakfast and how popular that's gotten, but the, the crazy way that we had to pull that off by dragging everything from the senior center to the um, Masons. And, uh, but the event was The so event well was great. And, uh, it was great. And it was worth it, but it, it's a lot of work doing it that way. Now, so, and, and Gene, oh, the Masonic Lodge, the Masonic, um, they yeah. donated that. They didn't charge us, did they, for that? I don't think they did. I don't think they did. No, I'm no. fairly certain that. Yeah, that was I don't it. think so. Again, you know, we looked at these public-private partnerships, yep. and 
um, because that's a rental hall yep. um, that we were able to use without without <coughs> cost. So. so, so Gene, I think you had um, when on your color color, color wheel chart, you had proposed I think a half time uh, another half time coordinator. It uh, would be the, taking the take, um, take the half time making it full. It, yeah, it's about a half time that that would go. It's, right now we're kind of squeaking by at about 30 hours. It would go to 35. So the outcomes that you would expect from that extra staff position would that be just more robust, you know, deeper robust of of what you just put on the chart, or doing things that we're not doing? Um, there's a couple of things that that uh, that we're working on, but we could be doing more, like. Um, the administrator's done a great job bringing the dementia-friendly program to the town. And she had a program last week. It was excellent. Um, so becoming a dementia-friendly community is really an interesting idea and something that we really should be thinking about. Um, and there's a whole lot to it, but the long and the short of it is, is just having trainings, like, for example, in the restaurants, so that when we have our seniors with memory loss, um, they can go in and have a meal and have a nice night out, and the staff is trained in a way to manage that. That's just one little example of how a dementia-friendly community could work. And, and so I think there's a huge opportunity there for the administrator to, um, to get that. She's already started. Um, but it's it's like what I was describing before in planning. You know, we all just jump in and and get the job done. Um, but with more hours, I think I think it can be done in a way that uh, that we can work a little bit smarter. Gene, do you have an opinion? And it's a, it can only be an opinion. To what degree the current center itself constrains your the, these numbers on the screen? Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about it with UMass, and we heard a little bit about it from the focus groups that they had. Um, and we know that there are some people that don't come to the senior center because when you get there, the bathroom is in the basement or up on the second floor, and they're just not comfortable having to navigate up stairs or an elevator to get to the bathroom. Do you think that's a 10% number, or do you think it's a 50% number? Mm -hmm. I, I, I know think it's impossible, but yeah, your best judgment. I don't. I don't know. I don't. That's a, an interesting question. I think that um, you know, frail elders um, are 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 hesitant to be in an environment they don't they don't really feel you know they can be okay in. You talked about the elevators <coughs> and the different floors. <coughs> Is the capacity itself <coughs> a limiter here as well? Just yes. Yeah. Just the pure size of the location. Yeah, it's definitely because it it. Well, witness, we had to take the Veterans Day breakfast yes. out of there. Yes. Um, yeah, there's no way you could have fit that. And yeah, I know yeah, when no we way. have the volunteer day, I mean, the place yep. is bursting at the seams. <laughs> it Thankfully, is. we have that many volunteers, but again, yeah. you know, space is a problem. We're the, um, about the smallest in among yeah. our peers. Yeah. For that kind. Far of. as square footage. And I would think also the the limitations of that kitchen are are huge. Yeah. That would just be my guess. So yep. the thing I'm poking at is these numbers would be measurably larger, I believe, if the facility were right-sized for the population. It's hard to know how much more, but my guess is it's more than 10%. I would say. And maybe it, it doesn't end up being a senior center. The more model that we've center, seen yeah. is more of a community right. center. Yeah. Shouldn't the veterans... That's why change in there. We'll get shouldn't the veterans well, the be there? The beauty of it is that it gets used, you know, right. more of the all of the waking hours right. instead of some of the waking right. hours. But you've got to have the capacity to drive that with the space itself. Yep. And let's face it, much as that's a it's a quaint, wonderful building, um, meeting those demands of the size of the crowds, and you can't even think about community center because it really can't handle the needs of our uh, of our population that's over 60 now. So. Yep. Yeah, it really doesn't. I mean, quaint, it is quaint. Lovely. It's a it's a lovely building, small, but it's small, not, it small just, building. It doesn't get there, um, and its facilities. I mean, um, being able to, you know, I, I know I think Jane's in the audience. We were speaking about the fact that that the kitchen is limited. Yeah. Um, yep. I mean, it's kind of a warm up kitchen, really. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Um, so these are just some some more graphs that show you kind of oh, where we're at. Oh, sorry. Question? Yeah, question. I just, uh, George Catch on Colburn Road. Um, when I went to the town uh, fair earlier this year, the interesting comment a uh, person made at the elders table. When I talked about the need for an override and the schools and community need <coughs> more funds, and also the elderly population, the senior center, etc. This person said, yes, but we'll be at the bottom of the list. And I think that's something to bear in mind mm -hmm. that we want to make sure that we treat the entire community, the young, the old, collaborating together. Yep. Well said, George. Yep. So the things that, um, the primary things that our need as needs assessment told us is we need for the Pleasant Street Center, improved accessibility, a first floor bathroom, and a modified layout to improve flow and alleviate overcrowding. Um, we also could do a little more with deepening the knowledge of existing programs and services. So again, extra hours for that administrator, um, get, get the word out more on the, on the programming that we are doing. Um, and again, going back to the topic of partnerships and um, our community partners um, collaborating more with them and and doing more that way um, the property tax worker program when we compare ourselves to other communities it's um, it definitely <coughs> for expansion and um, and then just some of the logistics of the center which I know we've talked about um, you know the, sp the staffing level, we're a, no, not only the, among the smallest senior center, we're among the most thinly staffed of our peers. So we could ask for a lot more to right size the staffing level. Does one follow the other though? As you right size yes. the center, then you have to right size the staff. Yes. Makes sense. Definitely. Um, Gene, has the board, and I, I, I will make this brief because I know you're. No, it's okay. Um, has, has have we talked before I got on the board? Has it been talk about expanding the size of that center yes. in place, or location, or both? It's uh -huh. come up, but it's really got yeah. the sharp point with this gerontology study, which really sharpened yeah. it from a kind of a survey of the beneficiaries. There have been some uh, general discussions about public-private partnerships. And I don't know, do you want to say anything about that? Well, I think we're going to run on. We could run yeah, off the rails here. But it, you, you know, it's a good question, and yeah. it, it, in, we have talked about it, and we need to talk about it more. Um, but tonight is, I mean, this is kind of a you know, kind of an opener yep. to that. We and are going to be talking about new uh, potential capital needs projects down the road. I would assume that this project could be in the discussion. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Might not be a build by the town. Well, yeah. there's, there's various options. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. And then just so this is, I will do rec and, and vets, and then we'll go line by line if that's okay. Um, everyone knows recreation. It's uh, the feel good group. They are doing all the stuff with the kids and education and um, just really making Reading shine. Um, 450 programs and classes in FY17 and they do a lot of stuff online which is great and people sign up online so that's less demands of people coming in the office or calling or whatever they really got this working beautifully um, they oversee the fields and the playgrounds they do field scheduling they do uh, playground projects they have over 40 seasonal staff that do the programming and then they coordinate town-wide events such as downtown trick-or-treat, Halloween parade, egg hunt, summer concert series, and other social engagement and community activities. Um, they sell out every year on the summer camp, all eight weeks. The Saturday night lights flag football's been a huge success. The hunt playground renovation, and then the resurfacing projects working with the parks department. You guys tell us where the kids are climbing there. That's uh, oh. not, not in Reading. <laughs> <laughs> All of those. Okay. That was not in Reading. Oh. That was um, something that they had to go and and there's a little teeny tiny print. Recreation now uh, plans offsite programs due to lack of facility space. Oh, yeah. I it. We put that in very tiny print. <laughs> but those are ideas that need to be talked about too. Yep. Uh, because those are happening in a lot of communities. Yep. 
Um, so you can see the red is FY17 and the blue is FY16 that you know everything's going strong with the programs uh, they're about the same a uh, little bit higher but um, these are tremendously popular programs that the community just loves um, those are the top three summer camp Saturday Night Lights and the rec in town Sunday basketball <coughs> And we generate a lot of revenue, and this goes into a revolving fund to pay for the expenses of running these things. So the only thing you see in this budget is the cost of staff. Um, and then last but absolutely not least is the Veteran Services Division, and that's Kevin Bowmiller, our Veteran Services Officer, and Kevin uh, and Jane are in the, in the audience tonight, as is Laura. So. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I should have pointed that out earlier. Um, but as you know, the goal is to um, use this funding, use these um, state dollars um, wisely. Reading's share is only 25%, so that's pretty good. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into even finding the people who would be eligible for these benefits. So many people don't come forward. And uh, I know Kevin spends a lot of time you know, in the community so that he can, he can uh, direct those resources where they're needed. Um, word of mouth is the best, obviously. Um, and the aid that they provide can actually go for um, assisted living or nursing home expenses. And many Reading families qualify for that type of aid. So that's a big help. Um, the Kevin's out in the community, which is great. He does the Scuttlebutt at the Pleasant Street Center, which is always very, very popular. I think um, uh, that's, that's just been a win-win for everybody. And um, the VetraSpec Paperless VA Claims Processing Program was implemented in 2017, so that even makes it more efficient to do everything electronically and um, uh, really is a, is a much, much better like our permit system better way of running things. And you see the stats there for who's collecting these um, benefits. And this, of course, is the best. It's the <coughs> pictures of who we, who we help with these programs. And um, uh, the guy in the, in the left-hand side, I was able to be there for that, which was a fantastic day. Um, and seeing him get his uh, sergeant stripes uh, after I don't know how many years it's been. Um, he was a uh, uh, guy that did the Battle of Batan um, yeah, and the Death March. The, yeah. the, the Batan War. Death yeah. March was in t intense, and he couldn't have been happier that day to get his uh, his sergeant status. So I think that is pretty much my presentation. I'll run through quickly my notes on um, where we're at with the actual budget. I think I've covered broadly where we're going, but just to go back to the detail on the actual budget. So the first thing um, is um, under Public Services Administration, um, where it says the office manager. That is a position that um, is now part-time. That was always a full-time position, so that's been a reduction. Um, the administrative specialist is the second thing I wanted to highlight. That's in that same grouping under Public Services Administration. Um, is, and that, that, is that the, that's the that's proposed the new? the zoning board. Um, oh, no. No, that was, both of these were, uh, uh, the office manager retired just this summer okay. and came back part-time. So that position went, in this budget, new to half-time. So um, that's, that's a half? That's a half, okay. yeah. And then the um, uh, the administrative services, uh, the administrative specialist, um, is a is a position we added last fiscal year, and um, and that's I'm just highlighting that because we've actually filled the job over the summer. Just 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 to be clear, though, Gene has, has used the word "add" a few times. Um, there's been some tractions on the other side of that. That's so what I was going to ask about that. So, so the permits coordinator used to be a clerical position, for instance, and so on and so forth. Right. Can I, can I make a, uh, what may be helpful is, I mean, you did a great job at sort of laying out kind of where you see sort of the changes, some of the ads, 
you know, maybe some of the things that aren't filled. Um, and a great job of telling the story. I mean, I, I, I think I think budget should be all stories and less numbers. <laughs> but that's just me. But what would be helpful is to kind of just maybe take those changes and put them on a one pager, saying, "This is kind of what we like to see. The cost. This is what we didn't add in. This is the, the expenses." Rather than try to go through and find each one of those different colored things on this, I, I'm mm -hmm. not going to be able to do mm -hmm. it. So, okay. I don't know. Obviously, not now, yeah. but. But Rather to that point, that. Gene, I think that, you know, you had three three positions and you had one expanded hours. Right. So if what we could do is that represents some amount of the 16% increase that your department's looking for. So if your department's looking for 16% increase and those three plus positions account for, you know, 80% of that, I mean, I don't know. I mean, right. I think that's going to be the easier way for yep. us to... You know, either take it into battle or you know, or not. And, yeah. and, may, and maybe as a message to the other folks who aren't up yet, <laughs> or the ones who are going tomorrow, you know, maybe just to do that because this way we can just look just at it. Just see and a say, snapshot. That's important. This, w w we know the story of what we're going to get if we add this. Now it's just a question of what do we think is important. Yeah. And what does it really cost? So, right. you know, so in the big picture of things, you have a 16% increase. Okay. Right. We fundamentally know that. Theoretically, we've got a two and a half percent revenue increase. So, you know, you've got a delta, yep. um, and that delta, you know, is somewhere around fourteen percent. And you know, in trying to give advice, which is really all we can do, or to carry the message out to the public, yep. what we need to be able to do is quantify that. So, you know, so essentially, you've got a fourteen percent delta between what we've got. You know, when it all yep. gets down to it, this is just arithmetic. I mean, you know, it's a piece of paper and a pencil, and it says this is how much you got, this is how much you can spend. And so then it becomes a quantifiable <coughs> issue. These positions that you've talked about, um, adding three plus, you know, three plus some hours, uh, I mean, you make a very strong case in every one of these. And so for us to be able to carry that message out to the to the voters who ultimately have to make that decision. We, I think it would really be valuable if we could kind of boil that down to something simple mm -hmm. um, of what that really means in money. Okay. So. I, 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 one one on that also. Could you also do it in headcount? I know we've talked about this in the past, but just specifically. So it's a change of 2.25 people. Well, it's from, three people plus an increase in one. Right, right. but what I'm asking for is what's the headcount now? What's the headcount that's being requested? Well, the headcount may not change. It may be hours, but no more heads. Yeah. But FTE then. Yeah. So okay. that we know specifically what we're what we're looking at, and that's that's the you know we, it's a comparison of dollars, it's a comparison of yeah. people, it's a comparison of how the people are are comprised. Right? You know, some of the stuff's reallocated. That's you know that's valuable, Mark. But I think when you know if we're going to be talking to voters, and we say, hey, your taxes are going to go up by twelve dollars if we get a recreation director. Uh, you, you know, I mean, you got to be able to. Yep. I mean, there are FTEs and there are percentages, but to Barry's point, the story is what's important. Um, I mean, you know, for Jane to be able to expand her opportunity to give more services, that's a, that's an important story, I think. I completely agree. I just think that it's also a fair way to to have a comparison. We started at the beginning of the meeting with a discussion of FTEs and, and how we're looking at them. Let's just look at them. Yeah, I, I mean, to, to, to Mark's point, I think it, it'd be much easier for me and, and, and uh, people in town to look at our sal salary schedule and understand it in terms of FTEs, because right now we don't know uh, whether that's one and a half people, two and a half people, um, and in some cases, if it's an individual getting a 3% raise or is it an individual going from 25 to, I don't know the exact math, but 27 and a half hours. That, that's an important thing to, to know because, um, and, and to go back in previous years and show that we've lost FTEs, um, you know, people hours, uh, boots on the ground, whatever you want to call it. I think the, the town was going to want to see that. You know, where we've lost um, 
worker hours and, and where we want to get them back. Bob? Uh, I agree with all those comments. Um, the way I interpreted the comments from the community was that's part two. Part one is what we're doing tonight to show you what we should be doing for the community and then to back it up with lots of data. And uh, painful as it may be, um, you will see the town manager wield his ax and list every single thing that is not funded that is listed here. And I will do my best to put them in a prioritized order from the hardest thing to cut to the easiest thing to cut, and that's not easy. Um, so that you can see specifically exactly how much each thing costs and exactly what it would cost in an overall. So I will do that. That seemed to distract from the message that yes. we're presenting tonight. Um, that would be very helpful. I agree helpful. with you. That's an important yeah. part. But this story it, it, it was important for folks to hear. Yeah. Is that the same format? That John was talking a few minutes ago about potentially just highlighting those three plus mm -hmm. a few hours. <coughs> Is that your thought, Bob? It would be those same three and priced out? And yeah, we've looked at it last winter um, for a potential override in the right, fall right. Uh, previously. Uh, <coughs> listing every position and listing what it would cost, including benefits, right. and what it would cost the taxpayer. So, yeah. Okay. I think it's easier for people to make a decision when yes, they see, absolutely. what am I getting for the dollars you're asking me to spend? No question. And I, and I think anything that, we, anything that we do as a Board of Selectmen in the way of putting forward an override, ought to detail that very specifically. Yeah. Um, because when it's an amorphous number, yeah. people have a very hard time embracing it. When it's when it's itemized as to what you're going to get, and tonight we're happen to be talking about public services, another night we're going to be talking about public safety, and another night we're going to be talking about you know, um, DPW and facilities management. I just think people are very interested in what they're getting for what they're paying. And what we're asking them to think about spending and what they will get in return for that, that currently is not present. All of those things you mentioned, Gene, you know, those purple boxes are, you know, they're absent. And they have, in some cases, they've been absent a long time. Other cases, they had, they they aren't there and should be there. So. Public comment. Yeah. Um, to bear in Mark's comment, I think that FTE information is helpful because it does help quantify what these numbers are. Sometimes it's challenging. When can we expect those that data? Um, for town meeting, we're giving it a good shot. L let me describe some of the challenges. It would seem to be simple. When I know their names, I can count them. Um, we share an assessor with Wakefield. We pay him as an expense, not a wage. <coughs> if we had an FTE system, a payroll system, it would miss him. We have a shared uh, regional housing services officer with four communities. It would count that as a full person. It's really a quarter of a person. So there's no technology that does all this. It's manual labor. Um, and you know, especially because of things that are part-time, um, and things that are sort of done as a non-wage. It's, it's challenging, and we want to be accurate. You know, every year until the last two, we've presented FTEs, and honestly, no one seemed to care. Yeah. Um, you know, every year there was a list of FTEs. The only thing they cared the about was year. the difference, right? Oh, mm -hmm. you, the only thing they cared about, oh, this went up, or I that guess. went down. It and, was more the delta than the number. What I remember historically is the town was plus or minus a few positions over a long period, right. 210. You know, it, it, the, the things change. But I certainly understand the point that it's an important thing. But I also don't want to dist distract from the message of what it would take to deliver the service that the town seems to need uh, by getting lost in the minutia of FTEs or any other math. That, that follows absolutely now. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to distract f from from that that either. But for me to, to, to really understand this and get it in perspective and understand how things have gone historically and the positions we've lost. Um, I think FTEs are an important uh, aspect of that. I understand that you can't do that for all the positions because it just doesn't fit. Yeah, I've had lots of discussions with Dr. Doherty, and it's just as challenging for them, at least as much because they have so many part time. Right. Just difficult. But I mean, Gene, Gene went through a number of these. Uh, positions and, and, and knows the people and knows how many hours they work. Right. So I think to the extent that, that that can be included would be very helpful for me. 
It might, it might be easier just to look at the incremental spend in the incremental hours rather than the whole McGill. Is that an easier way to do it? It's, it's relatively simple to compare the current year to next year. Right. But people have expressed interest in five and ten years worth of history. That's much harder. Yeah. And, unless we go to the town meeting booklet, take the number, and use it, that you have done. Right. right. Um, it, it's not difficult. And again, you know, a full budget town manager's balance budget is produced for the FinCom. We'll have lots of data, lots of examples, lots more than you're seeing tonight. It won't have all those charts necessarily or the stories that Gene told, but it'll have more numerical information such as FTEs. Um, you know, FTEs should be able to be put into the FinCom budget, certainly if not, then the town meeting budget. Okay, but I, I understand the, the helpfulness that that number pr presents and others. Gene, do you have an electronic version of, of, of your presentation that you mm -hmm. can send out to us? That'd be sure. great. Yeah. yeah, we can put all this up on the website afterwards or any time. Yeah, that's helpful. Good uh, Regarding Barry's comment as far as telling the story, I think one of the things that would be helpful, and I think we've talked about, is having a high level overview of a handful of books that describes Gene's more detailed presentation. So that, for example, the building inspector is a really nice one, where we can say, by adding this position, this is how it benefits residents, and therefore it's justifying the expense. And that, I think, that's where the FTEs can be combined with this story concept. Um, and it lets people know what they're getting for gas. Any other questions before we move on? Okay. Okay, at that we'll uh, switch over to uh, Matt, or I think it's next with administrative services. Thank you, Matt. That's right. Um, been requested to take a two-minute break here. Sure. Okay. Clear the room. <laughs> just, just so you're aware.
Director of Administrative Services here. And before you tonight is the budget for administrative services. It consists of five departments, five divisions, and that's operations, town manager's office, human resources, technology, and the town clerk slash elections. And what I thought I'd do is I would give you a little bit of over overview of the current um, org chart and then go right into the budget and discuss the changes. There really aren't that many changes this year. It's pretty much a level funded budget. There are a few asks that I put in there for new positions that I've asked for actually for several years. So I don't even really consider them new positions or new asks if you really need them. Um, and that will be it. So I won't be hopefully that long. Um, so the first, if you look at the org chart, you can look at up at the top there I am. The blue bubbles, um, I think they're blue, yep. are the employees, and then there's boards, committees, whatnot. So the town clerk's office is over to the to the far left, and it's a really thinly staffed office. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But we have the town clerk, the assistant town clerk, and then a clerk's position that's actually shared by three people. One I borrow from Sharon up in finance, and two part-time people. So we're running pretty thin in, in that department. Human resources is the next department in that we provide um, support to the entire town, to the schools, to the light department, to retirees. So with most of the divisions in administrative services, it's not just specific to town hall. We actually serve the whole organization. Um, and human resources, I'll talk about a little in more detail when I get into the muni sheets. But we have a human resources director we have a human resources generalist, which is a fairly new position within the last two years, but we share that with the school department, so we only have him half time. And then we have a senior administrative assistant there as well. Um, the town manager's office, uh, we have obviously the town manager sitting, sitting to my left, um, an executive assistant, an administrative assistant, and another part-time position, which is usually we put a high school student into that position, an office assistant. Um, and we fund that through the summers and school vacations, but every little bit helps. If we move to operations, um, that's sort of a, a unique division. Um, that it's the centralized location for procurement, communications, constituent services, uh, shared staff, postage, equipment maintenance. It's sort of a catch-all. Um, it's really uh, designed to be centralized and promote centralization. And currently in that division right now, we have the business administrator. That would be uh, Jane Miller, who did the survey for us and presented the survey um, in, in great fashion last month. Uh, purchasing agent, which was a newer, again, centralized position so that we can do purchasing for the entire operation. And then operation specialist is actually um, a part-time position shared by the former HR director and the former town accountant and they work on special projects for us, um, including uh, review of union contracts and also um, trying to get up with employee self-service, uh, meaning employees can go on the computer and look up their own payroll information, which a lot of places already do that, and we're about to, I hope, roll it out uh, soon here in Reading. And then the last division uh, is the technology division, and that's pretty much what you think it is. Um, it provides centralized computer and telecommunications services as well as internet, audio visual, software, computer support, mapping, and again we provide support to the entire organization. Um, the the org, org chart that I'm showing you is actually done in 2016 and hasn't changed um, at all. I, I am going to recommend some changes tonight but I didn't put them, I didn't want to sort of jump over and put them in the org chart already. but. Um, that's, that's where we stand right now in terms of my department. So I think the easiest thing is there's only about three new situations that I want to talk about. So I'd go right to the Munich sheet so we can see the numbers. And you know if we can start up in, um, in the operations division as it comes. And there we go. And there's, uh, in the salary line, I'm actually, we're asking for an additional clerk for the town clerk's office. And it's a little confusing because we're asking for the clerk's office, but it comes under operations. Um, what's happening there is that the, the operations is the central area for a lot of the generic clerk admin, admin staff. So the theory there was that they could be moved from department division to division if needed um, without being tied to one division. But 
the need really comes from the town clerk's office, um, and so we're asking <coughs> for an additional clerk. The the town clerk's um, office is a very busy place. I know I see a lot of you stop by there on a regular basis. It's become busier. One of the reasons is the new public records law, and Laura is the, the head person for the public records law. She deals with most of the public records requests, and now under the new um, guidelines has to tr track every request that comes in um, through every one of our departments. So the tracking, between the tracking, fulfilling, um, I get involved at the higher level, I get uh, attorneys involved at the higher level, it's put even more of a strain on her, her office. Um, she's been asking though, even before the public records law went into effect, for another clerk for a number of years, partly because we have, it looks like we have a lot of people there, but a lot of people are job sharing, and she has a lot of work to do in terms of um, preserving public documents, digital storage, scanning, mm -hmm. lower level things that I would rather her not be doing, her time is more valuable somewhere else, Correct. but would need that clerk's position in order to do her job. So um, she, that was her first and her, her only ask uh, for the last three years, and I told her I would bring it forward to you and, and get some thoughts. So that's a uh, second full-time position administrative clerk right in the clerk's office so and again it's not a clerk like Laura is a clerk it's a clerk right. it's a lower level it's an right. administrative right. clerk um, the next uh, position I, I mean there's nothing really I'm asking for the town manager's this office is pretty much staying the same um, if you go to the uh, HR department I'm just getting to my notes HR department is another position that I'm asking for in that department, and that would be for a second HR generalist. So if you go to that line item there, you'll see there's a great increase of the percentage is 96.2%. Um, so we could have another generalist there. And the need there is, like I mentioned before, we do have an HR generalist and he's fairly new, um, but he shares, we share that position with the school department. So he's pretty much here two, day, two days a week and at the school department two days a week. And we have a good working relationship with the school department. If we need him on a special project, we can have him for a few more hours, vice versa. Uh, at the beginning of the school year, signing teachers up for different things, you know, he's over there a little bit more. Matt, how, how is that allocated? It, well, is it uh, allocated between the two budgets, or is it in the No, top? no, we pay for the whole amount. Okay, um, so. Yeah, we pay for the whole amount, and we share it with the schools, so. Uh, but just to be fair, it was put in, if you will, as an accommodated cost, so that we prorated it. So it really doesn't appear in this budget. It appears, it appears in this budget, but it was funded, if you will, first one year when we both agreed. I think we added it during maybe a November town meeting. So it was added, if you will, from the general fund, not so, from the existing. So is that person, the one you have listed here, is a generalist at a salary level? That's a new. That's a new ad. A second one. A second one, yeah. Okay. So you, you see so the, is it the line item is for two, two generalists, but well, actually one, yeah, okay. two generalists. So I guess what I'm saying is that the first one currently resides in the town budget, even though you have them, you only have them two days a week. That's, that's correct. I right. do yeah. allocate some of the cost of that position to the school, not on, not in our financials, but for the end of year report so that they can show the well, cost. Well, I, I think you're not giving yourself credit. I think you need to do that. I mean, that seems like, I mean, I, I would never question your accounting skills. Right. No, but I just understand. from a common sense standpoint, it strikes me that, I mean, when we start to look at, you know, where money's being spent and how it's being spent, I think it should be allocated where it's being used. Doesn't that make sense? Um, actually, there's a big problem with that, potentially. Um, to have a single person paid for by a school department and a town takes a lot of legal burdens, and this avoids that. So uh, it's not to say it can't be done, but I, I have an email from town council that explains yeah, all the process today, you'd yeah. have to go through for a single person to work on two different. I, I, I just love government. What exactly. was just you know? It's it all mass D O R. So but you know, is, it's interesting that we can, you know, in the last presentation, we can hire a person right. and divide them by four, right. and that's not a problem. I'm sorry. That's with other towns, so that's easier. <coughs> is the problem compensating them, or the problem no. using them in that role? The, the, the problem is because of ed reform, the school budget is sacrosanct, and to have anything coming and going, if you will, between the school and the town is very uncommon. You remember in the past, some of you will remember, you had to vote on is it called a special employee? Yeah. Um, Hal Croft at one yep. point was. 
this is the area you'll get into if you try to split a person's salary into the two areas. Is it this practically solves the problem? He's in two places. The money's in one place. Is it any easier if it's an accommodated cost? No. It's all legal. It's all legal. What was? The, can you remind us what the purpose of putting uh, the having the dual function um, as opposed to just having HR? They have an HR person. <coughs> we have an HR person. Was it? Was it? Um, an accounting thing? Was it a reporting thing? Why, why did we? I think we why did we do it that way? We both, a support well, we both had a need, um, and so you know, I think that, in, and we always want to try to do synergies with with the school department if we could. So we decided to have one position. That position would be shared, and it was budgeted at the time under the town budget. Um, it could have been very easily budgeted in, under the school budget, I guess, um, but they decided to put it under the town budget. And that's where it stands. Is there any way to allocate some of the expense back into the, any other part of the budget? Yeah. I don't think it matters. I, I think it's sort of, sort of the one reading thing. You know, if we had to pay for it as a town only and find the resources to do that, it would have been difficult. It came in off, you know, off the top, off the revenue. Right. But it's no longer paid that way. No, it is. It, well, that's how it got in there. That's all that matters. So it became a baseline number for the town to then use in the future. So would this second position be also shared, or would this Don't be know. just for us? I, they, I know that the, the HR director would like it just for us. Um, be, be, and what I was going to say, too, about the need for that position is that um, that department, that division has been really swamped these days as well. Increased hiring, um, more paperwork, more state and federal compliance work, um, more training requirements, more training in general. And we're finding, too, that it's getting harder and harder to hire people. Sometimes we have to go through the hiring process two or three times for the same job because we've had people go through the process and in the end say, hey, I, I want more money or I want something different. And we, we can't be very flexible when it comes to that. So they may pull out and we have to start the process over again. Yep. Um, and with everything, you know, in terms of training is, is a big, big part of what we need to do there as well with everything going on nationally. We need more training. Um, so that's something that um, that she's asked for that I agree that we should have. Um, and again, we serve the entire operation under this division. So um, retirees, light department, you know, we all, pieces of it go everywhere. Okay. Um, so, so, that would be so Matt, and, and I'm sure you and Judy have talked about this at length. Right. Um, do we need so let's jump for a second and say we need another person. Do we really need a person and a half? Could we release a person to the school department and add a person or keep a person and suggest that they make a hire? Well, we could, I, I mean. Or is, or is it that we need one and a half? If we need one and a half, I, that's a different story. I think she'll say that we need one and a half. Okay. Um, you know, we, uh, obviously we, she'll take what we can get, but I think she really feels that we need that you know, the one person we can share with the school department and one person just to help us out on a daily basis up there okay. in HR. All right. that's yeah. what, and, and I know from speaking to the superintendent, you know, he would also love Sean full time. We would love Sean full time. Yeah, he's so a great we employee. Him. Right, we do. <laughs> so, ideally, we'd each have one, I guess, and, and maybe one. Right. As Matt said, you know, HR is becoming incredibly complex. Yeah. And just to reemphasize that point, and I'm not sure if this was Barry's intended question, the light department and the schools each have their own HR director that do only school and light department things. The town HR director does town plus other things for all employees of the schools and the light department, so it's a little different. I got it. What else do you have, Matt? Um, so moving on from HR, I can move down to technology, the other, the other big change in the budget. Um, and if we go to the technology budget, you'll see that there's a new position <coughs> added called Software Training Coordinator. And again, we s I say it's a new position, but it's something I've asked for every year since I've been here, and it's been in Bob's look-aheads for a long time. And that's to have somebody that's centralized and that could actually train people and handle software issues. Um, currently, we divide those responsibilities up among not only technology s staff, but administrative staff, administrative assistants. Um, and it, a lot of people aren't that specialized in software issues. There's a lot of redundancy. I find that some people in one department are working on the same issue as somebody in another department. Um, surveys, like, you know, we, we have 
I found out we had several Survey Monkey accounts for the town. We really only needed one. Um, so you know things like that. Um, if we had that. We don't have that position, and that sort of hindered our ability to launch um, and support a better web presence, um, to do things like online building permits. We talked about even having online parking stickers for the for the depot, dog licenses. You know, we could do a lot with that sort of software. Plus, we have a lot of software. I think you heard that in Gene's presentation as well. When we have the Munis software view permit, um, so having that one centralized software coordinator would really, I think, pay dividends to the town and would help out not only the technology department but take a burden off some of the other administrative staff and other departments that currently deal with it. Um, and like I said, we, it's something I've been asking for for a few years, um, has not been funded, and at the advice of the technology director, I'm, I'm asking for it again. So is that, um, do, does the school department have such a person or are we, sh are we again sharing? Well, I don't think there's any. There would be any plans to share this. I'm not sure what the school department has for that type of. Probably different software. It's more educational. Yeah. So. Right. They may have more education. I think, um, Matt, this is a small point, but over on the percent change column, this happened a couple times. It says a zero percent change. Um, it we, can't be we, should, we should probably have something that like NA change. or because I, you know, I can just see someone from the town looking at that and saying. Yeah, uh, that's not a zero percent change. We, we can't override the accounting system. Uh, that's an accounting. Yeah. That's well, this isn't something we do. This is something software. Well, plus yeah, mathematically. Yeah. Right. No, no, I get that. It should say I, I get. I, I understand right. that. Yeah. Well, we can we can clear that up uh, when we do the when we do the actual budget. We put it in a different form. We put it in Wait, Excel. That's what FinCom yeah. will see, and okay. we could do that then. But in terms of the accounting software, which is Munis, yeah, this is the way it comes out. Okay. So. What else do you have, Matt? Um, you know, there's other, there's a few other things in technology, uh, cost and expenses that have gone up and down, and pretty much nets, nets out. So, I didn't really want to spend too much time there. And I just wanted to go back to the town clerk's um, budget, and I already talked about a, an extra clerk for her. Um, you'll notice there's some increases in the elections portion of the budget, and that's because there's actually more elections this year. So. It looks like a big expense, but we have to deal with the elections that are out there. And that comes um, and goes every year. And that then. comes in. Yeah. That Is comes there any offset that uh, came back to us on that early? Yeah, early we voting? request we requested it. Um, I think it was a little over eight thousand um, dollars for the early voting. Eight thousand two hundred thirty-three dollars and seventy-four cents is what we sent to the state auditor's <coughs> office. Um, that's what Laura assessed our expense for the early voting yeah. to be. And what do we get? Um, well, that was only sent uh, at the end of November, so oh, okay. I don't think we've gotten it back. So does that reflect early voting in our expenses because there's going to be more voting going on? Yeah, well, there will be early voting in the um, November November election. Yeah. Yeah. Not in town elections. That, that no, doesn't apply. No, no, and, it, and I think it's just, it's not the state primary either. I think it's just the state general right, yeah. election. Um, so that, that'll happen in November. Um, so that's really, you know, just a really high overview of what's changing in the budget. I didn't want to spend too long on the minutia, but if you do have any other questions on any certain line items, I'm happy to answer the questions. If you think of something later, please give me a call or send me an email. I'm happy to discuss it. Thanks, Matt. That's, That's really thanks, tight. Matt. Good thanks. Story. Okay, good. thank you. I'm Sharon Engstrom. I'm the uh, town accountant and finance director. And I thought I'd take a different approach this year and give you a little bit of an overview of what makes up the finance department and what we do there before I get into the numbers. Um, this is a um, visual that shows you all the pieces that make up um, the finance department. We have general finance, which is um, collector's office and the treasury function. There's 6.26 FTEs in that division. And that includes a treasurer, an assistant treasurer, a collector, assistant a collector, and then 2.26 clerks. Um, and that 2.26 sounds like a weird number, but we do have 
um, as Matt had mentioned, um, a shared employee that works in the collector's office and does one day for the town clerk's office. So she's 0.74 or 0.76. The assessing op, and we also have um, one person that works in the collector's office who shares time into the assessing office. So 50% in each office to 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 help out both offices. The assessing office um, does not include our sh our shared. Um, Regional assessor, he's a Wakefield employee. I only included our actual um, paid employees on our payroll, um, but he is part of our team. It probably should be included, but um, the assessing is made up of, it's 2.5 FTEs. It's made up of an assistant assessor, one administrative assistant, and a half-time clerk. And in accounting, we have me, <laughs> um, a 0.6 um, senior administrative assistant, she works 22 and a half hours, and one administrative assistant that works full time. I should mention that general finance and accounting are shared services. I mean, we are really doing work for all of the organization. We're doing for RMLD, we're doing for all the enterprise funds. We are processing their payroll, we are processing their cash receipts, we are wiring their money, we are doing the cash reconciliation, we are doing all of it. So in total, we have 11.36 FTEs, and I just want to get into kind of the volume that we see in this department, because it is quite, quite large. <laughs> so this is general finance, and this is just in no way an all-inclusive list, but some of the key things that we do in general finance. We do payroll <coughs> bi-weekly, um, and we pay about 13, 12 to 1,300 people um, bi-weekly. That, so that includes the schools? Mm -hmm. well. And our MLD. And actually, even the retirement board um, employees are paid through our payroll, then they reimburse. We do cash management and reconciliation for all of those organizations as well. Um, so that would mean wiring money. It would be all the reconciliation of all the cash. Um, so that's no small task, I can assure you of that, because since we lost our treasure, I've been heavily involved, and it is, it's a monster. How many wires do you send out a week? Well, it think. depends on the... Um, IMLD volume because we do process our wire still, right. so it fluctuates a lot. But I would say, um, I would say on a daily basis we would process around 12, 13 wires, and there is weeks depending on the IML, uh, IMLD volume that will go to like 40, 50 wires a week. It all depends on the volume that they have. And there's also a very small turnaround <coughs> with one of their. Um, vendors that they purchase power, we have to pay within <coughs> two days of receiving the invoice or they start charging us huge fees. So it's a pretty important function as well. We have to be on it. Um, state and federal reporting, all the quarterly 941s, as well as the, um, the year-end reporting of the W-2s, the 1099s, the 1099-Rs, and the 1095-Cs, all being done out of this department. Debt issuance doesn't happen as often, but it's quite an endeavor to get debt issued, and you will be seeing something later um, that you'll need to be signing off on. Um, quarterly property tax billing. We have over 9,000 properties, and we are billing every quarter for those properties. Um, we have utility billing for those properties, and we are billing every quarter. Um, and then we manage tax title accounts. When people fall in arrears, we work payment plans out to try to avoid a foreclosure situation. And then we process <coughs> all the payments. And it's last year there was 125,000 payments processed through the collector's office. So f when you look at the numbers, you start to say, wow, that's not a big staff for what we actually ha have to do. And that isn't everything. That's just kind of the bigger things. <coughs> for assessing, there's the valuation of all the property. They do field review where they go out to the properties and get updated information, data collection, and then they enter all that into their property um, database. They administer all the statutory and local exemptions. They bill all the motor vehicle. Currently, we have about 25,000 motor vehicle excise tax bills that go out. Um, and then they also do all the abatements for motor vehicle and property tax. They maintain all of our property records, and they, they do the, class yeah, yeah. the tax classification presentation to, to you every year and for the general public. And this past year, we adopted the new senior tax relief program which was advertised through the assessing department and administered from the assessing department and no staff was added to do it. So that was great. In accounting, we process all the invoices and send out all the payments. And 
Um, last year there was 34,000 payments, and as I mentioned, I had 1.6 FTEs to do that. Incidentally, Bob and I get the pleasure of reviewing those 34,000 <laughs> bills as well um, and signing off on the warrants. Um, and also, to the 125,000 cash receipts, yes. I get to review all those too for extra fun. Um, so the monthly <coughs> budget reporting to the department heads, um, the a senior administrative assistant on a monthly basis will send out um, a year-to-date budget report, which shows them the year-to-date budget to actuals so they can get a, a feel for where they stand. And I also <coughs> review those to see if there's any cause for concern, just high level. I'd wish to dig deeper, but we're kind of lean and it's hard. Um, because there's a lot going on all the time. Budget oversight and support. So that's what I would be doing when I'm reviewing all those budget reports or even just generally spot checking some things that look strange to me. I would be sending questions to department heads, kind of <coughs> highlighting to them, I'm seeing this and this looks strange. Let's figure this out. And I also provide support as much as I can um, in building their budgets um, because you know, police and fire and all them, they, they, you know, fire has never asked me, but police, when, when we changed the department um, head, um, the spreadsheet that was in existence had a lot of pretty high level Excel um, formulas and assistance was needed to kind of bring that spreadsheet forward and understand all that was going on there. I also provide support in terms of grants, managing grants. A lot of times a police officer is assigned a grant that they have to manage that's public safety related so they have to do it but they don't know a lot about munis and they don't know how what they should be looking at so i i provide that support and and thankfully we have entry um, who's two over from me on my right um, he was just hired in july he's my assistant finance director he's also the treasurer when we hired him um, we took the collector piece away which frees up a little bit more time for him to help more with that budget piece because I feel like I'm very, I'm spread very thin. The other things that we're doing is MUNIS support. Because our, um, our group has a lot of MUNIS experience, we tend to be the go-to place for questions. When things are going wrong, people call my group first, and usually they get their answers or help from the admins working in the office. But if they, if that can't solve the problem, sometimes it's a security setting issue. I set all the security of what anybody can see in Munis, and so sometimes I do have to get involved. Sometimes I'm making calls to Munis and I'm playing phone tag with them for days to fix issues, but that's going on in, in my department. The tax recap is done by me, and it's done to set the tax rate so that we can send um, the, the tax bills. So it's not completely by me. I do the financial end, and the assessor does the assessing piece, and the two pieces together um, come out to be our tax rate. We are certified currently for the current year, and we are working hard to get those bills out. <laughs> Free cash calculation. Um, we have to do this every year. Um, and. We usually use free cash at our November town meeting. We cannot use free cash until it is certified. And we can't calculate it until we've closed our year. And so it's, it's always a race to get this done. This year we didn't need it for town meeting, but usually we do. Um, but it is one of those, like the first step after getting closed is this free cash calculation because we don't know wh what we're going to need. Schedule A reporting is a report to the DOR that is required of us. And if I don't get it in in time, they can stop our state aid. So it's pretty important. Financial analysis and reporting largely done by me. Um, and it, it it's, should be more in depth than what I'm feeling like I'm getting done lately, but it, it's definitely high level. And, um, and then when I have more time, I dig. <laughs> so that's being done only by me, really. And then compile audit requests. Um, my, accounting department pretty much does the majority of what's requested from the auditors. So I figured I would just give you a high level um, shot of what our budget looks like um, by division, accounting, assessing, and general finance. And quickly you're going to, and it's just compared to our revised budget for fiscal 18 and it's just the proposed budget that you see here tonight. <coughs> And you can clearly see that the, the change that's happening is in the accounting department. I'll get to that in the next slide because it's clearly a much larger um, percentage than what you're used to seeing. <laughs> this is just the salary piece of our budget broken down by division. And the reason that that um, accounting piece is so high is that I've requested um, an assistant town accountant. 
Um, back when I started, I was just the town accountant and I was in charge of three people. And so I was able to do everything I needed to do to the fullest extent without any issue. Um, and then when we had the reorganization and the whole finance department minus some pieces that got moved to administrative services became mine, I noticed that there was definitely some strain because managing all those people comes with a lot of time. You know, when things come up, they're coming to the person and it used to be Bob and now it's me. <laughs> and so um, that there's a lot of time being spent managing that staff, guiding that staff. And then also the budget piece seemed to emerge when I became finance director. It's, it seems of a logical nature if you need help with your budget to ask the finance director for that assistance. So I started to do more one-on-one um, -on -one time with the department heads helping them with budgets. And so I spread myself pretty thin and I spent a lot of time at the office. Um, and I, it's very difficult to find the work-life balance. Um, but I want to be able to do everything to the best of my ability and I feel like the assistance would be greatly appreciated. I am not under the illusion that I will get it, but I ask just to put it out there as a as a something that would be helpful to make things better because the financial analysis that we could do if we had another person would be great. We're just so lean. The other thing that concerns me is those financial reporting things that I mentioned, free cash, tax rate setting, and schedule A, I'm the only one who knows how to do them in my <coughs> department. Yeah, we are too lean for me to pull somebody for several days and show them beginning to end how to do those processes. They're not difficult, but they're time consuming, and I can't carve out enough time to give somebody that whole exposure that they would need. Um, and so that's a vulnerability that I feel if I'm if something were to happen to me during that crucial time that would be a, a bad thing to have happen the one thing that we do have working in our favor is that the former town accountant is still on our payroll working part-time as that operations specialist and I would hope that if something awful were to happen to me and, she, and we needed that done that she would help us but that's part of the reason I ask I feel like that's a vulnerability that shouldn't be there um, I should be able to have a backup I do feel that most communities, or most of our peer communities, do have an assistant town accountant. And many of them don't hold the finance director role. Yes? How many things other like that, Sharon? Are there, are there other vulnerabilities in here like that? I feel like a lot of the other things are cross-trained. So Already? Yeah. Okay. Um, Good. But what I do find is that because we're so lean and there are busy times for each, like the collector's office is, at, is busy at certain times, if I have somebody on a vacation, what we do has to be done every week. So I find myself doing processing it. invoices, you know, doing that piece, because they're detailed checking all of those invoice batches and they're cutting all those checks and they're making sure that everything is correct, that there is no tax added to the bill because we're a tax exempt, that they've used the correct address, that it's the right vendor, all that to avoid us paying the wrong party. There's a lot of volume going on and it, it's done every week. And it can't wait. <laughs> so you're and so I'm filling those slots. The know? inefficiency of, no, you of your it. time yeah. mm. is yeah. the opportunity. Uh, the order of magnitude. Of we that have is people so that high. know to do it, but it depends on the timing of it. Um, and it's then like when we lost the treasurer in um, March when she had left, I was trying to fill that role for the four months it took for us to fill it. So we fall behind, and it just feels like you you're playing a up. yeah playing a catch up game. It's very difficult to catch up. What I'm happy about is Entry is catching on great, and we are doing fantastic work. We also have um, the prior treasurer coming in, helping us to understand all that she did because it was a lot, <laughs> a lot to digest um, and help us get caught up. Because otherwise, I don't think we'd ever see the light of day. We'd fall, on sh we'd fall months behind. Yeah. So in short, you're just looking. You're looking for a single person, 46.5 plus normal increases for the rest of the department. Yeah. So the budget is built um, person by person. So with what Bob had recommended was a 2% step and a 1% COLA to put in this proposed level one budget. If somebody's at top step and they're not getting a step, we, we just budget the COLA. So we okay. don't just automatically assume, oh, we'll take this line and increase right. it 3%. Okay. We build it bottom up. And so that is an actual right. figure. I guessed on what I might have to pay to get another body in, knowing full well I probably won't get it. <laughs> Um, but we have a plan B because I feel like the change that we made in making the 
um, assistant finance director, a treasurer assistant finance director, as opposed to a treasurer collector assistant finance director, is I think that maybe there might be enough free time for me to cross train entry to do some of that reporting. So we'll see what the year brings. I'm not under the illusion that getting public safety, you know, is, you know, I think public safety is more important than adding this position. I'm not under the illusion, but I want to highlight to you that it would be helpful this department to function better. So that's the only reason I ask. That's exactly why we're here today. Thank you very much for doing that. Thanks. And then under the expenses, there's very little to tell. The 3.4% that you see there is our regional assessor. We have to allot for increases year over year. We don't know exactly what that contract's going to look like. Yeah. And so we're being a little conservative there. What, he's an expense, not a... He's an expense, which is which why is he shows up here, because he's their employee, yeah. not I ours. Mean, the having him an expense is much less expensive. Oh, yeah. It, there's definitely cost savings there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, but I had to show some level of increase not knowing what his pay increase is going to look like for next year. We haven't negotiated that yet. And then the only little thing that's up in general finance, everything else was flat. We didn't increase anything else. We increased general finance by $500 for printing forms. That's the line item we use to print the tax bills. And every year we're just $200 under actual. So um, increasing it seemed prudent since we were coming in so close to budget. So, um, so that's the only other thing that's increased. This is just summarized, but when you look in your packet, you can see the line by line. If you have questions, I certainly am happy to answer them, but I highlighted what I thought you'd want to know. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> Great, great job. Thank you. Thank you. Nice and crisp. Yeah, I think that brings us up to uh, <coughs> the uh, finance portion. That's the yeah. end of the budget. Any questions? Any questions from the board before we move on to the last topic no. of the evening? Any questions from the public? Okay. You want to take two minutes? Can we take two minutes to let those folks get their circulation going? <laughs>
percent general obligation bond anticipation note known as the note of the town dated December 15, 2017 and payable August 17, 2018 to Eastern Bank at par and accrued interest, if any, plus a premium of $6,520.04. Move further that in con connection with the marketing and sale of the notes, the preparation and distribution of a notice of sale and preliminary official statement dated November 30th, 2017, and a final official statement dated December 7th, 2017, each in such form as may be approved by the town treasurer, be and hereby are ratified, confirmed, approved, and adopted. Move further that the town treasurer and the board of selectmen be and hereby are authorized to execute and deliver a significant events disclosure undertaking in compliance with SEC rule 15C2-12 in such form as may be approved by bound council of the town, which undertaking shall be incorporated by reference in the notes for the benefit of the holders of the notes from time to time. Move further that we authorize and direct the treasurer to establish post issuance federal tax compliance procedures in such form as the treasurer and bond, bond council deem sufficient, or if such procedures are currently in place, to review and update the chairman. 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 Yeah, uh, that's the motion, and that's the motion. It's second. I, I, I have a black one. I have one. Black. You need a call for a vote. Sir. Okay. Um, yeah. Is this a roll call vote? No. Okay. No. Uh, Mr. Did, Mr. did you get a second? Uh, yes. Yes. I, second. I, yes. Second. Yes. Second. John, John okay. seconds. Any further discussion on the motion? Yeah. All those in favor? Five zero. Okay. Thank you. And the only other topic Everybody tonight um, is the minutes. Ooh. I have a couple of questions. The minutes from uh, November fourteenth, which are in your packet tonight. Yes. Uh, move to approve those minutes as amended. Okay. Okay. I go in here. Oh, yeah. was the amendment. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, there's a motion to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? Fourteen. Motion. Second. Okay. Dan John seconds. Any further discussion or amendments <laughs> to the motion to the uh, minutes? <laughs> yeah, there are. They're in the packet from That's Thursday. That's case there are any. The minutes from uh, November 14th. All right. Okay, hearing none, all those in favor of the minutes as drafted? Barry, you win? 5 0. Okay, good. Uh, before we close, Bob, there's a number of questions, number of emails, including some tonight on my phone, about the um, second parking sticker. You know, the one in our packet tonight from December 6th, uh, I'm okay. writing to. Another one came today. Right. Are we responding to each of those? Or I should say, are you responding to each of those? Or do, do we need to do something? It, it could be as simple I as I acknowledge I got it, and here's the facts. Um, I will have to go back case by case. Yes, we are acknowledging them and responding. I can't say that's true in the last four days necessarily. Yeah, because one the came last today. I, no, I, I don't even see yeah, that. You're sure you didn't get a chance so to even look at it. Know if, if you get them individually, obviously I don't see them. So they go to the this was an all points. Was, okay, was, this goes, this if it goes to the selectmen, I'll see it. No, it was an all points. I'm the play. I you have more pens? Oh. We're doing with black. Or noon black? Yeah. Um, jo John, also on that point, uh, just to say it publicly, there were some questions about residents that live in certain areas and, yes. and what their rights and restrictions might yes. be. And the answer is we're doing the same as the past practice has yeah. always been, for better or worse. Um, so that if someone received a free uh, sticker to park in front of their house and they live near the depot, they will continue to get a free sticker to park in front of their house and live you know, the 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 depot. Window. Yeah, yeah, that now makes sense. That yes, we did. Um, the chief's con, but what the chief will tell you at some future date is um, we've done some recent research into how this was all <coughs> in the past, and let's just say it needs a little bit more structure. Um, and, you know, the board will have a call on what to make in the future. Anything from you should buy a $25 sticker in order to park in front of your house to a $150 sticker so you can continue to have one for free. But I will tell you that it's um, it's a fair amount of people that are impacted by this. Um, you remember the discussion about the uh, tennis courts, the Bancroft yes. tennis courts? Yes. And there's a few houses on there. And, you know, they were getting free stickers. 
what would what should that free that doesn't make any do? sense at all well we used to have one sticker that did everything in town you yeah. could practically go to the dry cleaners with it now that there's different <laughs> functions you know, how many people are we talking about um probably a couple hundred because they're parking out in front of their house. Let's get a different colored sticker for them. I was going to say, you almost need a third sticker that just says you can resident park in front of your house. Resident, well, uh, right, parking. right. You could neighborhood need a motion. No, no. I, yeah, they that's what you need to do. Yeah. So we'll handle it this year the same way it's been yeah. done. From the standpoint of, I mean, when you think about yeah, the, the, the cost effect, you know, oh, yeah. the cost effect, it's much cheaper to go buy 300 stickers than to give out, you know, 300, 150 dollar stickers that don't apply to the situation. Yeah, and just think about this. My answer to the chief was, I personally don't care. Let's say there's 200 houses in town that have this third sticker. I personally don't care if they park in each other's driveways, front yards. I, yeah. I don't think they need to be addressed specifically. So if, if the people that live near the depot want to go park in front of the tennis courts. Let them do it. Let them do it. Long walk home. We can't overregulate yeah, it. We're not going to put like different neighborhoods. No, we don't have staffing no, to enforce it. So. No, but all those that are yeah, of that nature. Left anything out? Pick it a different color. Oh yeah, absolutely. All right, um, we're still signing notes. Bear, if you mind checking that all you go through it, that Did all the other signatures are present. We can adjourn. We can adjourn, can we? Yeah, we can. I'll, yeah. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Five uh, zero at. Ten oh six.